Okay, everyone, don't you go anywhere because our special guest is going to actually give us the quote for this episode. He goes. Lucian Samasata. I am the writer of the book A True History. I want to make the following statement for full disclosure. I confidently pronounce that truthfully, I lie. I write of matters which I neither saw nor suffered, nor heard by reports from people I made up. Let no man therefore in any case believe these words. <laughs> Dude, when you said we had a special guest, I didn't expect it was the dude himself. He's yeah, looking man. good for like 1,800 years old. I'm, I'm a wizard, wizard. Harry. It, 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 <laughs> he's, I mean, he's, he's close to 2,000 years old, right? Hey, it's just that I have like uh, voodoo powers and I can talk to the beyond. Yeah, that's, you know, the, the audience should feel, uh, you know, very, very lucky that we were able to um, have Lucian as a guest for the episode today. <laughs> it's a shame we can't interview him. <laughs> I can't arrange that. You just got to give you? me the questions. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't promise you very hating questions. Oh, uh, welcome everybody. I, this is going to be one of those uh, really, really cool episodes. I am your host, Robert. And this is Captain Chaos. And uh, Ray down in Australia, <laughs> being freaked out by the stuff that these guys get. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice, nice. <sighs> So um, this, and, and before we we're going to get into this later, but I just want to uh, go ahead and say this. Uh, uh, um, I feel this episode is, is very important uh, because um, it is always good to look at the origin of things. If you are a sci-fi lover like we are, uh, it is always a good thing to kind of look back at the origin of sci-fi. And then this story has been um, the earliest account in human history of a sci-fi story. And I am very excited to uh, bring this episode to you guys today. And I'm very excited for the conversations that we are about to have. So with that, do you have some... I, I'm I looked at the date and my brain just went, is there a digit missing? <laughs> Yeah, so so for all of you out there who are actually looking at the title of this episode, yeah, that is the year. It's just been a while. 280. <laughs> it's been a little bit from here there. That is the year. Which is why I was a little surprised when Lucien popped up, because, you know, like, he's 1,800 <laughs> years old. <laughs> uh, is there a question? I mean, I feel there's a question floating from, from yeah. our very own mad scientist. <laughs> What, what have you been watching, guys? <laughs> I I'm gonna go first, like always, uh, because I I'm just that excited. Um, I've been watching Star Trek with my wife. <laughs> yeah, I just uh, I have I'm I'm happily uh, I'm I'm happy to announce that we finished the Next Generation, and uh, we started watching now. I think there's four movies we for, before we get into. Uh, the Deep Space Nine, and um, it's it's great uh, to be able to do. At least for me, this is uh, one of many multiple re uh, recaps. Uh, I mean, rewatch, and um, it, and it's interesting to see that um, my wife had the same feeling, where she actually says, "Yes, I'm going to rewatch this whole thing again." We haven't finished. We're almost, we're definitely a lot farther from half of the whole thing that we have to watch. Um, and, and it's kind of interesting that, you know, I, I feel we're not alone as to why some of us, and I know it's not everyone um, that, that chooses to do a complete rewatch. You know, there's always certain um sub IPs, if I want to call it that, within the 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 whole Star Trek uh, universe that uh, not everybody likes, right? So uh, that's the reason why I say it, not many of us actually do a complete rewatch of the entire franchise. Um, but it, it's really interesting. And, and if 
it, it feel, I feel like you're not alone. Well, and not, I'm not just speaking about my wife when I said this, but like many of my uh, other friends that I know that have rewatched the entire uh, Star Trek saga, when they said, yeah, I finished this and I think I want to do it again. And, and it, it just, you feel that you're not alone, uh, not a, you're not alone in your love for that IP. So, and of course, we are watching also Ahsoka. Great, great um, uh, a TV show. And, and again, like I said in previous episodes, uh, I'm really excited that I'm finally able to see something that I was previously only watching in animated format into a live action. And it's always a great thing. And, and I think so far they're doing a great job, considering that they are the original creators who are involved in this. Mm -hmm. so that's what I watched. So let me ask you, Robert. I'm already mentally prepared for you to be saying that you're going to be watching with your great wife, Star Trek, <laughs> for the next five years. <laughs> and the last 10 years before that was Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're waiting for Doctor Who to come out. Oh, There's no. an awful lot of that. So. Oh, it's never yes. Gonna end. It's never gonna end. We're gonna make a section, a new section, guys, for for Robert called "Me and My Wife and Star Trek." <laughs> 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 Maybe it's gonna be a new podcast. <laughs> Me and my wife and Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, me, I've been watching thanks to you two that are making my anime list just incrementally impossible to supply <laughs> but i you're actually welcome. finished gate you're you're welcome man you, you, you're so welcome gate, gate yeah. is awesome <laughs> you guys are trending me back into an otaku i just need to <laughs> run sweat and not shower <laughs> and i'll have the full starter pack <laughs> <laughs> but didn't you watch donnie darko as well uh yeah i watched donnie darko actually yeah that's true i totally forgot about that one i watched donnie darko uh for the first time it was very good uh, and I am now cruising through Luck Horizon, which is not really sci-fi, right? Mm -mm. It's like a fun fantasy, I guess. Yeah. But that's what I've been doing. Nice. What about you, Ray? Uh, I'm, I've been a bit short on sci-fi this week. I was just having a think going, what have I watched? But I, I need to catch Ahsoka at some point. Oh, me too. I haven't even started. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I I have to say that, and 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 I might be wrong here. It's just my perception, my personal perception. Um, you don't need to watch anything else to enjoy this show. Um, however, there's a lot of like, um, I don't know if when I call it references to Rebels, uh, mm -hmm. and, and I think in my perception, this is actually the continuation from Rebels. So it would definitely help if you watch Rebels and then watch Ahsoka, but it's not necessary. Yep. That's a good thing about Star, uh, Star Wars is that you can enjoy IPs all across different timelines of the universe and enjoy every show separately. That's something I like about it. Yeah. Okay, so should we go into our next segment? We are Science Fiction Remnant. This is the Funny Science Fiction Podcast. We are the Caribbean Science Fiction Network. We are Monorats. We are One Accord Level 2 Podcast. This is Jesse from Sudden But Inevitable and Open Pike Night. This is Sci-Fi. Well, everybody, and for This is Sci-Fi, I want to remember everybody the reason that we started the movement with the hashtag, this is sci-fi. It's a great place for you to actually find a awesome community of people that enjoy the love for science fiction of all kinds of topics, games, movies, TV shows, game, uh, I repeat games, but yeah, there's never enough games, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but anything sci-fi that you like, uh, just, just go online. The beautiful thing about hashtags is that you can use them almost virtually in every social media you can think of. That's how you actually get to search your, your favorite things. And just accompanied by This Is Sci-Fi. And I promise you, you'll find great discussions and conversations. You might click with somebody that you have something in common that you enjoy. It's the perfect gateway where you can meet with like-minded individuals and share the love for that that you like so much. Yeah. 
And that's uh, that's pretty much how we we have built our our, our community. As, as you know, um, and you know, we love sci-fi in general, right? So mm -hmm. it, it is amazing to then not only find people that you have com commonality with uh, yep. on a specific IP, but also find people of things that you have never watched uh, that maybe you were interested in see their perspective. Um, yep. And, and you know, grow to love something else or something new. Yeah, that's, that's the other beautiful thing. It's just like if you're looking for that new series or show, uh, manga, comic, whatever you like, that's maybe that you how you can find it. I usually accompany that by uh, podcast suggestion, uh, TV show suggestion, anything. Mm -hmm. And then I put this is sci-fi next to it. And I never have a problem. And I actually forgot, even though we passed that part, but that's how I got a, one of the I started with watching Foundation. Oh, yeah. And I had a, one of the best conversations over Twitter. It was like 20 posts, but I just took my time because I loved it. Yes. About Foundation from, from Isaac Asimov. Uh, and, and it's all thanks to that hashtag. This is sci fi. Yes. Definitely. Okay. So. Should we go to the next segment? Yep. Shout outs. And for these shout outs, actually, we want to start by remembering everybody that we're members of the Blind Knowledge Network, an awesome variety of content creators ranging from podcasts, streamers, and more. Don't miss it and go and check them out at www.blindknowledge.com. Anybody says www anymore, bro? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, probably. <laughs> they, just say, they would have said, like, correct myself blindknowledge.com <laughs> and, and I'm going to start with the first shout out it's a, a big shout out for our awesome Twitter follower uh, is stream, uh, streaming streaming bubble uh, thank you for your support and engagement it means the world to us let's keep the conversation and tweets flowing they are fun to listen go to their Twitter too and give them a follow and enjoy their pod they're great next is uh, we have actually Scarif Ro. You still owe me a drink, man. <laughs> but it's you, the one that's gonna drink it. <laughs> but still, I got nothing for love for you. So I'll let everybody know. Go and check him out. Go check Ro at Scarif Podcast uh, in Twitter. You can find their tree link over there and find them on your preferred social uh, media platform or where you listen to podcasts. Uh, he's also man. He's also always getting bringing great content. Uh, I got nothing but love for him, and I always have a, a ton of fun when we have an offer and when I listen to it, too. And last but not least, a uh, shout-out for Robopulp. Man, I want to tell everybody, don't miss. He has a great podcast, too. And I also, I always appreciate the constant engagement. Uh, he giving us shout-outs and basically just showing the world and his community uh, what we do. And that goes a long way, and we really, really appreciate it. It is all for our listeners and for our community that we do it. And also, I want to remind, by last but not least, that we just got our TikTok up. So you should go and check us out uh, at Sci-Fi Remnant in, in TikTok, and you're going to see a lot of fun stuff. Right, Robert? Yeah, I just want to add that, you know, I we had a lot of followers on the other account. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a story. I mean, me and Gio were talking about this, and... And, and yes, I'm sorry, I screwed up. That was my personal account. <laughs> Oops. So if you see another account that has content for Science Fiction Remnant, we did not get hacked. That, <laughs> that's the real account. The, the one that says uh, Candela, C-A-N-D-3-L-A-S, that's my personal account. You can still follow it. I, I, I don't mind. But we are going to start pu uh, publishing all our... Um, uh, sh uh, episodes and, and and all our content on on the uh, on the new account. So you were gonna say all our shit? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, probably not. Yeah, probably that, not. <laughs> yeah, that, that's in the Captain Chaos mind. So yeah, everything <laughs> is through the lens of chaos. <laughs> <laughs> chaos is talking heads. <laughs> always, always, man. So yeah, the, uh, if you see that second account, we did not get hacked. That's just our real uh, our uh, real account going forward. Yep. And that's all for the actually for the shout outs for this episode, man. Awesome. So going to go into the next segment. The Outer Remnant. 
I guess it's my turn. Yep. <laughs> Hey, you guys didn't have your game on the weekend. You could have come over and uh, hung out on the live stream with us. Actually, Robert and I spent like five hours doing social media work <laughs> on LinkedIn oh. and, and TikTok, putting the TikTok up. Yeah, we were. Yeah, I know what, what's not and what else, but like we started like at two something in the afternoon. Oh, and yeah. it was like six. Like I was hungry as hell. He was tired as hell. I was tired. I, I just, and I was like, okay, dude, <laughs> see you never. <laughs> I had a nap. <laughs> I couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> Nana naps, huh? You yeah. <laughs> and, then, and, then I, and then I went on Friday. I tried to listen, but when I got a notification for Alita Army, I actually clicked and it was already over. Like, I, I think I got like an hour later. <laughs> yeah. So if you if you don't know, Captain Chaos has cried. So, yeah. yeah. It was a sad day. But so, it's a great opportunity to let everybody know. Go to the Alita Army on YouTube and hit that subscribe nice. button, right? Right? Oh, yeah, for sure. Look, uh, there are actually two Alita live streams. The the, the first one is on um, Friday night, Eastern US, uh, which is, I think it's 4 p.m. Um, I think that's the time. Or am I wrong? No, no, it's, a, it's an hour later, so it's 6 p.m. 6 p.m. on Friday, Eastern U.S. is um, uh, the Alita live stream on uh, Creek Indians channel. Uh, and that's pretty laid back. They just, you know, they come up with a, a topic, um, you know, hours beforehand. <laughs> and um, uh, they, don't, they don't need to stick to the, to the topic. Um, you can basically go on there and talk about anything you like to do with the leader. And then 20, 23 hours later, we have the official um, uh, Alita Army um, Radio Chaos live stream, which has topics assigned weeks in advance, theoretically. Uh, and um, uh, it's, it's the more official one on the Alita Army channel. So uh, this week, we were uh, back to the source material. Episode 179 was uh, Gumu, Angel of Redemption, Dogmaster Cycle 2, Melody of Redemption. Lots of redemption this week. Um, <laughs> basically, uh, it's source material, which they should be adapting for the next uh, movie, which um, uh, Rodriguez and Cameron have uh, made a commitment that they intend to film and they just got to convince Disney, come on Disney. Uh, and then, then we'll be getting a sequel, but um, it hasn't been officially announced yet, but uh, there, there's always, uh, you know, things creeping along slowly towards that goal. Uh, but we were covering the second fall of uh, Japan. Uh, basically, um, if you remember Sarah, uh, he, he the, the girl who, who took him in and looked after him, Sarah, was actually, um, well, in the movie he was McTeague, the dog master, but in the in the um, manga he's Murdoch. So there's a bit of a, a, a name difference there. But she was his daughter and Zapan killed her and now he's after her, after Zapan in revenge. So um, he goes after Zapan. And, of course, a leader can't help but, you know, get in there and stir things up a bit, but um, she was involved as well. But uh, if you're interested in finding out how that goes down, you can read uh, that chapter in the uh, Angel of Redemption uh, volume of the manga, or you could listen to that live stream, which has been recorded. So that's over there, episode 179 on the Elite Army channel under live streams. Nice. And, I mean, it's about revenge, man. That's, that's oh, sweet. Yeah. Well, I guess you know that diabetes, like people with diabetes, cannot get revenge because it's Can sweet. We? It's sweet. Oh, oh can, okay, I see. Uh, and, and <laughs> not, even, not even in the original Klingon. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they hate to be cold too, so yeah. Sugar. Well, you can try to get some sugar-free revenge, but it will be a sour feeling afterwards. <laughs> I feel totally ripped off now, man. I'm going to just talk <laughs> for the rest of the stream. <laughs> oh, no. oh, dear. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know if we... Are we really ready? No. For this? <laughs> yes, bro, let's just get a couple of mushrooms, get on a boat and start flying, man. <laughs> I, uh, 
I got I got a plot, but uh, I don't know. I'll read it. Did you I'll have read a plot? It. Uh, well, no, I'll read your plot because I, I don't think this is on Wikipedia. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, it's it's um, it's too old to be on Wikipedia. Are you sure about Wikipedia? Wikipedia, no. right. it was Wikipedia. Wikipedia, it was lost in the fire of Alexandria. Uh, oh, that's what happened. Yeah, that library. makes sense. I'd say so. Yeah. Yep. Okay. <laughs> so, keeping in mind, ladies and gents who are listening to us, that uh, this is a uh, book that was written um, eighteen hundred years ago, so it's very much out of time. Um, things have changed a lot uh, since that time, as you would probably have guessed it, it's very hard to imagine what greek society was like back then um although it has been um uh, made clear that um at the time there was basically two types of books that were published a travelogue and a debate book so that was pretty much it we didn't have heaps of fiction and there wasn't genres um there was these two types of books that were generally accepted and purchased, the travelogue and the debate book. Now, uh, this fellow, Lucian O. Samosata, he was a satirist. So if you don't know what a satirist is, basically you poke fun at everything. <laughs> so basically he, he, was, he was a cynic, um, a serious cynic, and uh, he didn't think much of a lot of Greek society. And uh, he was well educated, so he decided that he would write uh, a travelogue and a and a debate book all rolled into one. That was completely and utterly bullshit, as we call it down here in Australia. <laughs> now, why he wanted to do this was to make clear that most of these travelogues were written by people who'd never left Greece. Well, let me add something to your comment there, uh, yeah. because I also uh, read that another reason why, um, I mean, there was many reasons, right? But among uh, that reason as to why he hated both types is, you know, he's seen what they have become, right? So originally, and you could, o you could only imagine this too as well, the, the travel log was supposed to be an assistance to, especially in those times where travel was not only dangerous, but was very hard to actually find books that would actually tell you, okay, you know, the best routes to take, uh, where, you know, where's the, the best meals, the best uh, hotels. I mean, you know. Which, which time of year to go and when to avoid going to certain places. Exactly. So what happened, and also for debates as well, um, for for the educated, which was this was the audience. It was a upper class educated uh, population. Um, the debates were also um, very um, informative. You know, you have uh, debates when they're talking about it. They're debating a topic uh, and back and forth. And and I don't know, maybe in one volume, two volume, three volume, which whichever it takes, they got eventually to a point, and they can move on to to another thing. So what happens is. Uh, and this is what I learned in, in my my research on on this topic is the fact that it, it's all about the money. They wanted to sell more books, so apparently they discover that if they embellish and they exaggerate certain things, they would sell more books. Do you imagine if in a time like that there would have been a third class, third class of book called Fifty Shades of Athens? <laughs> <laughs> So, and, and I'm sorry, I'm taking the, the long way out there, but I just want to include this into your comment, Ray. Um, sure. they, they, eventually, they were trying to outsold each other. So it's like, okay, this person said this thing. He sold something. See, he sold more than me, right? So I'm going to add this. And, and it just escalated, not only in the travel, travel log business, but also in the debate business. To where it got to the point where Lucian said, you know, he, I imagine he would literally said, this is bullshit. I mean, everybody's selling and none of the stuff is true. None of these people are even traveling outside. So how in the hell are they going to, but they're making money because they're creating this fictionist stories 
about stuff that they, you know, places they've never been. So I was telling Gio the, the, when, uh, today we, we were having the watch party. It's like I envisioned him, him to be a true Floridian when he said, hold my beer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He decided to tell the biggest lies of all. <laughs> hey, and show and show the ancient world what true sensationalism was. And <laughs> go hard or go home. <laughs> he succeeded because although you audience out there may not have been experienced to this, because I find not many people are aware of this being the the I call Lucian in, to me, Lucian is the the father of science fiction. And you might not know about this book or might not know about this story because this is my experience whenever I mention it out there um, that, that, you know, about the story itself. But um, even today, you can find this book. It's not lost to to time like many other books that, you know, lost reference. And yet it is like like Ray alluded to, it is it is kind of hard to understand not because it's a hard book, because it's, it's also very short, uh, but it's because the language that is being used in it <laughs> is really dated. And another thing that I want to add to that is it, it is understandable because this is directed to a completely different audience, an audience that doesn't exist anymore. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I'm sorry, Ray. You can continue, but I just want to add <laughs> that to to. No, no, that's continue. fine. That's fine. I I think you said it better than I could have. But um, basically, um, on a couple of those points, uh, the language used is quite. It's not. It's not as archaic as Shakespearean English, um, because uh, like I used to go to Shakespeare plays, and I'd come out talking like that. <laughs> Oh, not God. Much sense. <laughs> just because it would get in your head and start messing with your sentence structure and stuff like that <laughs> but um the, the the language used here and the construction is not current english it's it's a bit flowery and a lot of the words aren't in common usage like i had to think pretty hard about what what they're actually saying at certain points and then go back and listen to it again because i'd sort of lost lost track of the plot but um it 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 is enjoyable in that it's different because you won't hear English like this very often anymore unless you go looking really hard for it. It's not common English anymore. So um, you will find it entertaining if you enjoy languages and how they change over time. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, this is a translation from yeah. Greek, so there's all those problems with the translation. And certainly um, even to the point of measurement systems, um, the version that uh, Robert listened to was talking about furlongs, uh, which you may or may not have heard of from horse racing. They still use furlongs in horse racing. Uh, but um, it's, a, it's a Greek uh, measurement. Uh, well, it's a, it, it is a Greek measurement um, that isn't commonly used anymore. And uh, But the version that I listened to was talking about stadia. Mm -hmm. which is roughly about the same distance as a furlong, so, but it's a completely different name. And Stadia was taken up by the Romans from ancient Greek. So uh, it's also mentioned in Roman histories about uh, as a distance measurement. So um, for those that are wondering, it's somewhere around 180 metres uh, for, for the, 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 the modern not American audience, <laughs> which is... No, I, I did work it out, um, which is roughly 590 feet. Yeah. So um, for, for uh, my American cousins there. But, yeah, so, you know, the measurements are different. The, the, the language is different. The references are different. There's probably as many in references in this story as there are in Marvel movies. Yes. But we won't understand them because exactly. we don't live there. We don't know the people. I mean, perhaps a Greek uh, historian might get some of them, but I bet you there's a few that get passed to the keeper because. It, it, I was just going to say, Gio, um, it, it seems like he hated Plato too. 
It was a bigger motherfucker. <laughs> it's, a little bit. it's like he's like he could not suppress the tone of his boredom and hatred. <laughs> can, we, can we ask Lucian or is he gone? <laughs> I, I, think, I think that we can ask Lucian uh, like uh about what he thinks on uh, on Plato actually. Go, go ahead and question. ask him because you know I'm kind of curious. Let's see, man, what he has said. It is funny you mention it. Plato was not there, it was said he was living in an imaginary city under the constitution and laws he himself wrote. Can anyone be more full of themselves? <laughs> <laughs> wow, Lucian has some strong points for Plato, huh? And feelings. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a direct quote from the story, by the way. So, yep. <laughs> so that you know um, it wasn't something we made up. I told you, uh, I can bring him here, but it's very limited what I can get him to say. <laughs> In every right story. It's the technology. To bring him, every time we bring him up, it costs a lot of money, man. That's time yeah. travel. It's crazy, you know? Mm. So, uh, Ray, I, I want to make... Uh, like um, a, just, bef just before you wander off, I will actually do the plot now that we've had some <laughs> preface. Oh, you know, I was just going to say, you know, what you, when you were making comparisons on, on the, the style of uh, writing and, and mm -hmm. how it is typical for you to, to get lost and, and reread, because that happened to me too many, many times, um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to give the audience a little example uh, before you read the, oh, the yeah, plot. Sure. Sure. So, if you remember what Lucian said at the beginning of the of the episode, there's actually a conversion from the book that makes it a little bit more understandable, um, uh, and and that's what Lucian mentioned because you know he wants to be nice to us. He don't want to talk in his language and and get us all confused, right? Mm -hmm. So, if you get a quote from the actual book, I'm going to try to read this out. This is the the actual quote that he said, but it's as uh, on change from the book, from the English translation. I believe this English translation was in the 1800s, if I'm not mistaken. So this is a direct translation from the Greek. Exactly. So it says, I turned my style to publish untruths and with an honester mind than others have done. For this one thing, I am confidently pronounced for a truth that I lied. And this, I hope, Maybe an ex an excuse for all of the rest when I confessed that I am at I am faulty in for I write of matters which I neither saw nor suffer nor heard by report from others which are in no being nor possible ever to have beginning beginning let no man therefore in any case give any credit to them. Now, how confusing is that? And that that's in code so that the poor folks can't find it. <laughs> and that's actually in the book. That's that's part partly why I had to go back and analyze and then reread again and then get the story. I mean that's I, even that's even closer to sort of the sentence structure of um Shakespeare, which you really have to think hard about to get the meaning from. Yeah, yeah. I feel on my waters listening to that kind of language. It reminds me of like what I use whenever I had to write a email on my uh, on my corporate life. You know, instead <laughs> of saying "Okay, be good," it's like I wish you the best in your future endeavors. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <Lowry>. <laughs> <laughs> shall uh, we plot it up? Let's not delay this any longer. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so plot, such as it is. <laughs> <laughs> the novel begins with an explanation that the story is not at all true and that everything is a complete and utter lie. The narrative begins with Lucian and his fellow travellers journey out past the Pillars of Hercules, which is um, the Straits of Gibraltar. Blown, of course, by a storm, they come to an island with a river of wine filled with fish and bears. <laughs> Yeah. Bears. yeah. Okay. I don't remember the bears, but okay. A marker indicating that Hercules and Dionysus have traveled to this point and trees that look like women. Now, interestingly enough, the version that I um, read didn't have the trees killing a couple of the sailors. Uh, so it may have been, um, you know, uh, PG 13 
Um, but uh, apparently there is another version where the tree, the, the, the trees that are shaped like women kill the sailors. So that, that is the version that I read. Hmm. See, I didn't get that. I, I can speak to that because we read that part. Um, so it doesn't actually say it in the plot here either that the trees killed the women, I should mention. Shortly after leaving the island, they are caught up by a whirlwind and taken up to the moon, where they find themselves embroiled in a full-scale war between Endymion, the king of the moon, and uh, Phathion, the king of the sun, over colonization of the morning star. Both armies include bizarre hybrid life forms. The armies of the sun win the war by clouding over the moon and blocking the sun's light. Now, that that it's a very much a shortening of the battle. Uh, in fact, the moon army won the early battle because some of the sun's, um, uh, what would you call them, um, allies didn't show up on time. Yeah. But then when they did rock up, they laid waste. So. <laughs> So, um, yeah, it, it, it didn't go well for the, the, the kingdom of the sun to start with, but in the end they, they won. Um, so um, it just says here both parties came to a peace agreement, but didn't actually mention that um, uh, oh God, Lucian was captured by the warriors that were uh, allied to the, the, the sun the ruler of the sun, and were actually taken as prisoners of war and were returned once the peace treaty had been ratified. So that, that bit's being left out as well. Um, both parties come to a peace agreement. Lucian describes life on the moon and how it is different from life on Earth. Yeah, you can say that again. <laughs> <laughs> For starters, they're all dudes, except before the age of 10, they weren't dudes. Yeah. <laughs> um, not going there. <laughs> yeah, not, not going there. <laughs> After returning to Earth, the adventurers are swallowed by a 200 mile long or 320 kilometer long, if you're in the rest of the world, whale, uh, in whose belly they discover a variety of fish people against who they wage war and triumph. <laughs> wow, this thing really leaves out a lot of stuff. Because they actually met uh, an old man and his son who were traveling salespeople who were swallowed by the whale. Yes. And they explain what's going on. And then the guys who were from the ship, Lucian's mob, went, oh, we can, we can take out all these guys for you because we actually have weapons and they don't. So um, they, they decide to wage war on these fish people. And they only lose one guy, which just happened to be the um, the pilot, which they'd hired to get them around. So they lost their most important guy, besides so Lucy, of course. Much karma. I, I wonder, Ray, if this has something to do with the fact that there are so many versions of this book. And, and it mm -hmm. makes sense. I mean, this book was written in 200, uh, 280. Yeah. So there has to be, like, many translations. Yeah. To me, to and, me, it's like the effect of you playing Little Secret, you know? By the time that it goes around, it's completely nothing of what it started. And it might suffer throughout the years, through. I guess. Well, well plots often leave things out, but I think some of the things that the plot, this, this version of the plot has left out were kind of important, so I'm adding yeah. them back in. Okay. Um, so, Wade Dwarrigan's fish people, they kill the whale by starting a bonfire. And giving it diarrhea. <laughs> it... <laughs> it, wasn't so, it wasn't so much a bonfire as they burnt down the forest that was on the islands that were inside the whale's stomach. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, and escaping by popping by propping its mouth open. Yeah, so they got some big beams of timber and propped the whale's mouth open and got the hell out because the whale was dying and they didn't want to be caught in the corpses that sunk to the bottom of the ocean. Yep. One heck of a big corpse. Do you mean they don't have submarines? No, that, that, that was Da Vinci. Not in the version I read, but who knows? <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, next, they encounter a sea of milk, an island of cheese, and an island of the blessed. There, Lucian meets the heroes of the Trojan War, other mythical men and animals, as well as Homer and Pythagoras. 
Uh, they yes, that that Pythagoras, the one that invented Pythagorean theorem. Uh, they find sinners being punished, the worst of them being the ones who had written books with lies and fantasies, including Herodotus and Satius. Yes. <laughs> Self-referential much? Yes. <laughs> After leaving the island of the blessed, they deliver a letter to Calypso given them by Odysseus explaining that he wishes he had stayed with her so he could have lived eternally. They discover a chasm in the ocean, at, but eventually sail around it, discover a far-off continent and decide to explore it. The book ends abruptly with Lucian stating that their future adventures will be described in upcoming sequels. Doesn't happen. Uh, a promise which disappointed scholars described as the biggest lie of all. Now, um, that's the plot for the main part of the book. This, this really reminds me of... Um, uh, uh, What's the, what's the term? It's, it's just disappeared from my head. Um, sort of sort of uh, fan fan novels. Oh, what are they called? <laughs> fan fiction. Fan fiction. Thank you. God, my brain. Yeah, this kind of reminded me of fan fiction in the way that suddenly the writer gets bored and decides to go off on a completely different tangent, <laughs> and the story completely takes because this is the plot for the main part of the story, and then at least the version that I read, there was a whole nother chapter where there's a completely different story about uh, a guy who attaches bird wings to his back and flies up to the moon, gets a message from, from the moon saying, oh, all these, all these um, uh, people are debating about me down there and they're, they're they're speaking all these lies and it's terrible. And I hate being this close to the earth. Can you please take a message to Jupiter? Jupiter being the um, the king of the gods, uh, saying that uh, me, the moon, is sick of being near earth and I want to get the hell away from it. <laughs> so then he flies up to where the rest of the gods are and hangs out with them for a while and passes on the message. And Jupiter's like, oh, this is a bit disappointing. I mean, they're not even sacrificing things to me anymore. What, I can't relate. What are these people? I can relate. <laughs> and then and then he goes to the spot where he can listen in on them. And there's all these people, you know, asking for the exact opposite thing on different sides of wars and people wanting their parents to die so they can get the inheritance and all this like sort it. of stuff. It was it it's like, you know, the most selfish crap. And and Jupiter Very goes, human. Well, you're not getting that, you're not getting that, you're not getting that. Oh, that's a reasonable request. Okay, you can have that. <laughs> It's like, and you know, this guy wants rain and this guy wants sun, and they both live in the same country. It's like, don't know what to do about that. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, all the troubles that the gods go through because all the people are just so flip floppy. And yeah. hence why we have a rainy sun. Yeah, that's why we have rainbows. But anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, and then basically the guy gets to hang out with the gods for a little while and then he gets the ring, wings ripped off his back and he, he gets taken back to Earth by Mercury, uh, which is the god with the wings on his heels. I believe. Not, not, not that I'm saying I know the Greek gods all that well, but I think that, that's right. Out of his Nikes? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so basically, Hermes Hermes basically the, the final chapter is something completely different ragging the hell out of people in general, but specifically uh, people who debate uh, or the people of the time who were debating about all the different things that nobody could prove, like was the moon inhabited? Uh, was, was it made of cheese? Was there a man in the moon? All this sort of stuff. And everybody had a different, different opinion and they all pushed their own opinions, wanting you to believe it. And they, nobody had any proof. I think that so, it, 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 it was stated as a fact when we watched the silent movie Le Voyage dans la Lune that the, the moon is made out of cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> so when they say moon dust. <laughs> yeah, we have a problem here, man, because we actually have rubber hook on dust. <laughs> <laughs> he gets stuff watching dust. 
Oh God! Yeah, <laughs> okay, I've 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 done my job now. You two can just go spastic. <laughs> oh my god and that's why we have captain chaos man <laughs> well well monica is this man below me here oh wow at a chaos so you know i want to say um why i wanted to do this book right and and i kind of alluded to that at the beginning of the show um because i had moon dust in it <laughs> moon dust. <laughs> if you like science fiction if you like, you know, Star Trek, if you like Star Wars, if you like any IP that has to do uh, with science fiction, Alita, uh, Blade Runner, uh, or any genre, I feel that it is very important to go back to the origins. Um, knowing where something comes from helps you understand its historical and cultural context. Um they you can identify the influences on other things um understand better when you hear or see a new story where things may have come from and how they evolved um i believe you understand science fiction better when you can uh, you know see where it comes from uh this is partly why we have done a trip to the moon uh if you guys uh, go on our catalog and you can actually um, download that episode. You can pause us right now if you want to uh, listen to that episode. Um, that uh, was the very first science fiction film ever done in human history. This is the very first science fiction story ever written in human history. Or at least that you could, that we can go back far enough, right? For all we know, there was something better, and we lost it to the Alexandria fire. Uh, but to me, and, and again, I, I invite everyone to reach out if you know of a older story that could be uh, the origin of science fiction. I am willing to um, to listen to that. Um, I am. It's, that's the kind of hunger that I have for science fiction story. But going back to, uh, that's the reason why we wanted to cover it, or I wanted to cover it on this show, is because we are science fiction fanatics. And it, it is, it, it's always good to go back to the origins and understand. Um, and, and it's kind of cool that we have this writer that for complete different, um, uh, for complete different reasons, um, kind of like became, in my mind, the father of science fiction by creating something that bothered him. Um, and and he, there was something that bothered him and he wanted to create something to show people, okay, this is what you guys are doing. You're destroying. Uh, so in doing something completely different, he unexpectedly created something new. And this is what this story was coined to be the very first science fiction story. Now, before I mention it, have you guys experienced this story before? No. No. So this pretty much would be the very first time that you got actually read this story? Yep. Was it, like I said, very short? Yeah. Okay, so you understand why I had to read it. And in part, um, because I, in this, I liked it, but uh, another reason why I read this so many times is because of the language. Um, I remember the very first time that I read this, um, which we, we could probably move on to that question, um, after I finish my answer, uh, the very first time that I read this, I was really interested because I was researching. I can't remember the, the, the context of my, my research, but I was like looking, I like science fiction and I had a question one day I was in a sofa and I'm like, it was big years ago. Right. And I'm like, you know, I wonder what is the very first science fiction story? You know, I know of The Trip to the Moon, which is a French film that was created. But what about a story? What about a science fiction story? And, and I went to Professor Google, and I found this book. As a matter of fact, um, 
the book that I read, it came from, I don't know if you're familiar with the Google Archive. It has a collection of old books. As a matter of fact, that link's still alive. And I downloaded the PDF, which was really a little annoying because what they do is they scan a book and they put it in there without any checks, right? So it was, uh, and, and I think you found it, Ray, uh, interesting because every other page was a Greek original. And the reason why they do that is, so if you know Greek, you could actually fat check the translation. I don't know Greek, so I just kind of skipped those pages. So I, when I read this for the very first time, I was really into it uh, for this fact, right? This is the very first science fiction story ever written. And I, I'm going to experience this. And I read the first sentence and it was hilarious, but it was hard to understand. So then I read it a couple of times. Once I think I got it, I moved on to the next paragraph. And this is how I read it the first time. It took me a while. It was a very short story, but it took me a while to read. So this is the reason why I went back and read it again. Because now that I read it, the next time that I would say the second time that I read it, I got different things. And I understood the paragraph a little more. And the more I read it, the more I understood. Eventually, I encounter, uh, and, and this is something that I, I really want to feature on, um, on this show. Um, um, well, not necessarily feature, but I do want to mention it uh, on the show, that there is a video that was, um, and, and this was, fairly recent, it was last year, that was, um, uh, that was posted. Um, the account is Austin McConnell. Um, and I encountered that video through my research, uh, my, my further research lately, because I'm, I'm, I constantly kept interested in the story. And the name of the video, if you go to Google, you can actually type, which I love that name, the absurd Second century space opera you'll never read. <laughs> Love that name. On point. I, I should I should mention that you find this story under multiple names. A true history yeah. trips to the moon, not trips mm -hmm. to the moon, but trips plural. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean it's been it's been translated and, and renamed a number of times. Yeah. Uh, I actually will post a link to that YouTube video because I think it deserves um, a watch. Um, if you read the book, uh, again, reading the book is is, is the best uh, to experience. And I would have to recommend a multiple reads. It's a short book, so that helps. Uh, but if you don't want to go through that, uh, this video gives you a lot of good facts. And, and I give props to the creator because it shows uh, the time spent on research. Um, so that's the reason why I want to post a link on, on the video description I mean, uh, of this podcast so you guys can go and, and enjoy that video. But um, I still recommend it, find the most accurate version. Uh, the older, the better. Because uh, the oldest that you read, that's how I like it. the more uh, you will guarantee to have the most of the of the story within uh because there's a lot of there's a lot of variances on this story just as there are many names to this book um so that would be partly the reason why i reread and reread and reread because i want to experience it and to be honest with you and, and this is something that i might get your you know uh, your answer on later on in this episode, is after I reread this story, I enjoyed it. I really do enjoy it. Um, I would have to say it was a journey for me because, in a sense, I pushed myself because I wanted to experience. I am that much of a sci-fi fanatic that I wanted to see where things came from. And this is the reason why I pushed myself into um, understanding the story. And now that I understand it, 
it's an experience that yeah. I will never, I'll take it with me. And uh, I'm really happy that I did. So I strongly recommend, um, you know, get the book. It's a short book. Read it and reread it just like I did. It's worth it once you understand it. Uh, but I would have to say you would have to love sci-fi um, because this is the origins. This is where sci-fi came from. So if you want to see where Star Trek came from and the influences or Star Wars, this is the origin. It so, came from Greece. <laughs> well, just like everything comes from Greece. I mean, I mean, we've well, not everything, but I Thanks, mean, we, we 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 may have listeners out there who have a Chinese background, and there may be something way off in the, the history of Chinese writing exactly. that, that could could have science fiction bent on it as well. So, mm -hmm. I mean. I, I doubt that science fiction just appeared once in one place. Yeah. People have always looked up at the stars and the moon and everything and wondered about them. So I, I think there is probably an ancient Chinese writing or an ancient Aztec writing or something in various parts of the world that could be considered sci-fi. I mean, this is the obvious one that we can find and is still printed today. It, I, this is the reason why I brought it up because because I want to know. I truly, truly, I am that interested. If you're listening to this episode and you know this is not, this might be the second story, I want to know. Reach out. Tell me the story. I'll go ahead and buy it if this is something that I can buy and experience it because I want to experience sci-fi. So if you like have a Chinese background or some other part of the world and you know of an ancient sci-fi-esque story that could be considered, you know, a, pre a precursor to sci-fi, uh, please let us know. We'd like to cover it. Hopefully there's a translation too because <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we may not be able to understand it otherwise, please but make it, it would be helpful. <laughs> uh, just, just before you go on, I wanted to give a little bit more context. So you've got to understand that when this was written, at least in, in Greece, there was nothing else of the sort. I mean, there was there were stories of odysseys and, and trips to fantastical places where there were fantastical monsters and everything like that. But there was nothing written about travelling through space and people living on other planets and other stars and, and you know, space wars and all this sort of stuff. Uh, there's, there's no record of anything like that until this guy decided to go, what, you know, hold my beer. I'm going to make up the most fantastical piece of bullshit to show up all these people who are bullshitting in their travel logs. Um, so, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pay them all out. And he, he did it in fine style, and in doing so, created a genre. Not that he knew he was going to do it at the time. So looking, looking back through the history, successful of science, accident. <laughs> yeah. But looking back through the history of science fiction and that we've all experienced being, you know, members of modern society with all science fiction, the wonderful science fiction in which it contains in its entertainment, we can look, look, we look back with that sort of rose tinted glass. But what you've got to remember that this guy had none of that. So you have to, I know, I know it's a big mental hurdle or a big mm -hmm. mental effort but you've got to push all that aside and try and imagine for a minute that science fiction has never been heard of before. And then this guy wrote this. And if you look at it through that lens, you can understand how monumental this work is. And yeah. he didn't even mean to do it. Yeah. Which is kind of like irony. <laughs> but, yeah. You know, but yeah, I mean, he's paying everybody. Out. I doubt that he would ever know or known that he created a genre. And, and you know, I, I, I not. Tell me if you guys agree, but it gets me thinking when he has to go full disclosure right at the beginning that this is mm. purely a lie and fabrication, that he had to do that because, I mean, most people don't think of what the reality of the times were. But actually making such false statements as true, we're getting hanged or decapitated. Well, let me tell you something about that. Heresy. <laughs> let, me tell you, let me tell you something about that. I think he did, you know, he, he did that. I, I don't think. I know he did that on purpose because... Yeah. Most of the travel logs, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Ray, uh, on your research. Most of the travel logs and and the and um, the other type of books, the debate books, uh, mm -hmm. at that time, there were no well, almanacs, but there, they they actually said at the very beginning of the book, this is fact. 
Mm. This is true. So he knew they were lying. He knew they were bullshitting, but they're telling people, they're selling people on the truth, right? So he said, okay, hold my beer. Here's the book. And I confessed that I lie. So he, he's, he's doing the opposite to kind of like get, I, I imagine he had a passion when he wrote this and he was pissed. Satire. He was pissed. You can tell that when he, he gets to the end of the, 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 I think it's the fifth part and says, and what happened on the other side of the world will be covered in, in, in the sequels. And he goes, no, I'm not writing them. It's the biggest lie of all. <laughs> and now I'm going to go off on a rant. <laughs> that whole last chapter is just rantacular. Yes, <laughs> rantacular. I like that word. It just, yes. it just, it just, he's just ragging on everybody. And he says, and and you know, and actually in the in the fifth chapter, he says, Oh, and on this island, all the people who wrote false travel logs and, de and debate books and made shit up are all suffering in hell. It's like, yeah, including me, because I'm bullshit. <laughs> self-referential much <laughs> yep and, and you know he wrote more than 80 books he was busy. Uh, he was he, yeah he was busy and i mean when you think about when you think about the the, the amount of creativity that takes for all of these to be coming from somewhere you know from mm -hmm. a person's mind it's actually something uh, uh, admirable uh, admirable you know well uh, <laughs> Was he and I'm snorting getting... moon cocaine? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Maybe more from. <laughs> if you look at sci-fi writers of today, you know, uh, most of them, you could tell, especially if the sci-fi piece is is well done, that they have done their research. And and as far as I know, most of the sci-fi writers, um, whenever they have those masterpieces, they've actually done their research. Uh, they they ask some scientist. They read some science, uh, science, uh, scientific journals. Uh, they, they research. They go online. They go on Google. They do whatever, right? We do have some scientists back in Greece, but those are, you know, the, the, the beginnings of, you know, the, the observations of the stars and stuff like that, right? But this guy came up, and this is one of the things that I find so incredible to me. This all came from his head. And what could possibly be the amount of research that Lucian could have done to create a story like this at that time and come up with something like this? Aside from that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you kind of look at it with a modern perspective and a lot of what he came up with was just like bastardizing things on earth, like, you know, f giant flying fleas and birds with lettuce wings. And, you know, just <laughs> like you look around and go, yeah, if I combine that and that, that'd be pretty weird. Wouldn't it make it like, you know, as big as a, well, they didn't have buses, but you know, as big as the Ac Acropolis, <laughs> you know, <it's> just, <laughs> He's the Salvatore Dali of uh, ancient literature. There you go. That's I, I go with. That. <laughs> I go with that. Uh, I, so, I mean, think about it. W the way that they navigate to the moon and the stars. I think that if you make a logic out of that, it's just once you pass the edge of the Earth, uh, you just fly by the turtle that is waiting underneath. And then you make it to the moon or to the stars, right? You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised. I'm surprised that he did not take the approach of far, uh, the flat Earth, which has uh, I, I like to imagine that was. I think it might be implied. Um, it might be implied well, because they, really they were navigating on the ocean all along. No, no, but see, here's here's the reason why I said it's it's not that it's not flat, uh, because they were navigating on the on the ocean, and they got into a whirlwind, and that whirlwind picked them up. And they get, they got on top of the clouds and then they pick up the winds from space and ended up in the moon. <laughs> there, well, were, there was wind in space back then. Spe speaking of that, the, the moon wasn't very far away, according to their measurement system. <laughs> exactly. like it was, 
It was very close. I mean, clearly, the moon was a lot smaller than it actually is, and it was a lot closer. So, <laughs> and it looks like a giant internet Google Earth, I guess, because it's you get inside of it and you can communicate and spy on people. And, and the reason why I mentioned that, uh, Gio, is he could very easily said they were navigating on the uh, on the ocean, and eventually they reached the end of the Earth. They fell off and landed on the moon. That could be very easy. Because back in those times, that's the common knowledge, right? Or am I wrong here? 2000 AD, yeah. wasn't it? 200. Uh, I mean, 200 AD, that's, you, that, yeah. I like to think that that's a common knowledge that the Earth. We are now in 2000 AD. So, <laughs> so that's why another thing that, that I find fascinating, they didn't go, he didn't go that route, which could have been. Uh, and right. maybe, maybe, and, and I'm, I'm estimating, you know, I'm, I'm like guesstimating. Yeah guesstimating here but maybe he's doing it on purpose because everybody says that this the, the earth is flat and because everybody's saying that and he wants to do a satire he came up with this incredible you know you lift off about the the clouds and you ended up and and maybe that's his way of paying everybody else back that said that it was you know the earth is flat and yeah i know it's flat but i'm gonna go with this because it's bullshit yep and then say hi to the sun towers out there <laughs> <laughs> and, in, and 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 he is he was closer to the truth than the rest yeah the Pretty giant much. space centaurs from the milky way <laughs> <laughs> he's closer to the truth now. <laughs> hang on what? yeah <laughs> oh god oh um, yeah so he he's he started and this is something that I want to, I guess I want to mention. Actually, you know what, before I mention that, let me go back because we, we we have gone around and around. I want to get your... In a whirlwind. You, exactly. <laughs> we are definitely in a, in a chaotic uh, whirlwind. Um, uh, Ray or, or Gio, whichever of you want to go first. The first question, uh, which I already answer from my perspective, um, obviously it, it, you, you were today's all when when you learned of this basically can compare to the span of time from the time that this story has uh, was written um so we're going to go to the next part of that question it's like what was your first impression you go you... right you go right because i am actually marveling of what you got to say about this hard <laughs> science fact piece of work <laughs> hard science. uh well you know i was i was listening to this because it's on youtube rather than reading it uh because then i can do other things while i'm, I'm i did the audio book too yeah but um it was more it was more a case of man i want some of the drugs this guy was <laughs> <laughs> pretty much <laughs> i did that way and i, I were in the same place listening <laughs> like uh, recently when i had open heart surgery uh i was on some pretty serious opioids after afterwards and um, all I got was like conversations with people that weren't in the room. Like I, I, I'd be having this conversation with somebody and I'd open my eyes and I'd be by myself and I'd be like, well, shit, I was alone all along. <laughs> and that's all I got. But uh, this guy got some really trippy shit. <laughs> well, imagine Ray in the, in, the, in, the, in the room recovering like, come over here, Mr. Blueberry Muffin. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a camera in in my hospital room? <laughs> <laughs> oh god! Don't worry. I, I just mean that realm. I, all of, I just mean that realm of existence in the past. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Blueberry, you know all my secrets now, Gia. This is terrible. And then they were probably trying to bring back to bed because they're like peanut butter jelly time, peanut butter jelly time. No, that was the guy next door. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Although he couldn't swing his arms around above his head because you're not allowed to do that for the first six weeks. <laughs> uh, so first reaction then. Well, uh, it was it was a little tricky to get into, um, but it was quite interesting. It was. Um, I probably did myself a disservice in listening to that video that you told me about with the sort of synopsis and commentary from that guy it i'm not saying that it was a bad video but rather than having been prepped before i listened to it i probably should have listened to it and then 
read his commentary just or listen to his commentary just to um, get it around the right way. But yeah, I mean, it's it's an experience um, to to admit. I mean, it's really hard to imagine that this was eighteen hundred years ago. An experience, or would you say pretty yeah. much more a trip? <laughs> well, to the moon, yeah. To the moon, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, once you get over sci-fi to to in 200 ad and you listen to the des descriptions i mean um being being a biological scientist and you know being in my 50s now i think i would have reacted to this quite a bit differently in, in when i was younger um and if i if i didn't have my my knowledge base that i do have uh but yeah i mean it, it is quite trippy in in the idea that somebody came up with this stuff 1800 years ago I mean, I, I look at um, the, the the early modern sci-fi writers like Mary Shelley, uh, Jules Verne, and Edgar Rice Burroughs, and I wonder if they read this. Yeah. Did, did they read this and get some ideas out of it? Because yeah. you know, it's it's these days you can't write sci-fi in a vacuum. There's so much sci-fi out there that you would have seen some before you try to write something, but this guy had never seen a sci-fi movie. He'd never read a sci-fi novel. All he had was what was in his head. And when you think about it like that, that he had nothing before this, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, being able to embellish to that scale your level of reality, if you try to simplify what he did, that's what he does. That's what he did in this book. Mm. He, he heavily embellished what he knew as reality and make crazy allegations about things like giant freaking insects and birds with lettuce leaves. Lettuce leaves. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. So that was your first reaction then? Hmm. Um, Gio, what was your first reaction? Now that you heard uh, mad scientists. Honestly, man, this, this made me realize that you don't you don't really need drugs to trip. <laughs> you just gotta read this book. You just gotta be Greek. <laughs> sign the same thing, bro. And I mean, it didn't. It didn't scare me a chuckle every time that he couldn't. Like, like in like I was reading some kind of very subtle hate towards another <laughs> philosopher or writer <laughs> of his time. It was like, yeah, this is my kind of guy. <laughs> he was angry, man. He was definitely angry. But, but but it's just like it's just like you guys said it, it's it's very interesting uh, to think he's really a pioneer of of a genre because there's nothing like it before it that we could pretty much tell or it's something that has been already lost through the fabric of time uh, and forgotten so it looks like he was. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't know why we're juggling, you gotta go to our YouTube channel, subscribe and, li and listen and watch. It's more fun, <laughs> I promise you. Uh, but also listen to us. Uh, so, but but basically, it's it's something it's something admirable. Like I was saying before, uh, when you try to put aside the exaggeration and how comical it can be, and, and look at really the creative work put into words. Uh, and and the power of creation that the mind has really, uh, it yeah. makes me wonder sometimes. Just like Ray back back the question, maybe ancient China or something like that has stories like this, mm -hmm. but they are lost in times or or due to cultural uh, barriers, they they are not that mainstream or known as they should be. They could be there for all we know, and then mm -hmm. not just they're not translated to English, and we mm -hmm. may never know. And, and that's what I also like. I always have had a deep interest in, in investing myself in inter, intercultural matters. It's because you always find new things and always you, you learn amazing things that are part of the past that makes us what we are creatively and, and in all sorts of the matter or what makes us unique as people, you know? Hey, hey Gio, what do you feel about? Because uh, I, I haven't, I'm going to ask because I haven't heard your opinion on that. The English barrier, did, uh, I'm assuming you found it as hard as we all did to read this book. Um, how hard in particular was to understand this story? It wasn't, it wasn't for me because I remember I, I don't watch sports or much of what most 
people do. What I enjoy my time doing is watching documentaries, reading about ancient mythology <laughs> and ancient history. So I feel right at home with this because uh, when when I read or watch something that I enjoy, this is the kind of language that is brought in, you know? Yeah, I, and the reason why I was asking is because it, it took me, I, I want to say that to really enjoy this book, because um, I read the actual I, I didn't have a, an, an audio book. Um, it, it took me maybe four or five, ta- five times before I can really comprehend because mm-hmm. uh, the, the, the language to me, although it was English, uh, it, it was a barrier. I would have to kind of understand what they're saying to understand the story, kind of like what Ray just, just uh, told us. And, and yeah, I mean, it, it leaves me wondering what would be the difference if I could really have a version of it that will be closer to to what it really was trying to be said line by line, how different would it be? You know? Yeah, that's true. That's true. And and, and that uh, our 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 Greek audience um might have uh a better understanding because um so far out of all the translations that I've seen, um I happen to keep a one uh, there was in the eighteen hundreds, um those translations do have the Greek page on mm-hmm. the, on altered, on changing, um, but since I don't know Greek, um, you know, I'm I have a question. I have a question that probably none of us is prepared to have the answer for. But you think that there's actually a uh, a, a transcription of the original work somewhere preserved? Well, that's what they are Great trying question. to do over the years, and you find different transcriptions. Not, not uh, yeah. I mean, many like like a like a like just a record of it, like the original works, word by word of what it was. You think that there exists, or you think that also as Greek language itself evolved throughout the years, it had changed? Well, the original Greek would not change, right? Because that that story was written as it was written. Um, I know on the times that I researched um, that there had been many attempts. Uh, I think there was one done in 1600s. Uh, the one that I have is in the 1800s. Um, you could actually go to a library and get a collection of different uh, transcripts because basically they're not translations. They're transcripts. They're someone that knows Greek and that knows English goes page by page translating as close as possible um, to the original story. So I think because of this <clears throat> is where we have the difference in the title of the book. Uh, we have so many, you know, we have a true story, a true history. Uh, we have so many different, uh, I think I even seen a trip to the moon in, in some of those. Tri- trips as in plural. Trip, trips to the moon. And, and and if you look at those, and if you look at the transcription, you're going to notice there's a difference in the year and the person who actually did it. Uh, the uh, best way- I would hope that from, to that from the year 200 AD to the year 800, a different person would. <laughs> Just well, you know, it, <laughs> and I'm sure that they ha- we probably have lost some to history, like uh, some translations. Those are the only transcripts or translations that were kept, um, you know, somehow safe, and, and and the ones that we are experienced up to now. Notice how I think the earliest transcript that I can remember seeing, and I might be, uh, I, I might not have found the other ones, is the 1600s. Um, I could not find the book, but I'm sure you can go to a library and find a copy of that, uh, especially in, uh, I think the, most of the ones that I was looking at, they were in uh, England uh, for the translation. Uh, but I'm kind of curious to see, maybe we'll find earlier versions in a, say, in a library in Greece. But um, <clears throat> yeah, that I think I coined that to the fact as to why there are so many versions and how some versions are missing some things that other versions have and accounts for the name change in each one of those versions. Uh, can I just bring something up there about, you're talking about a translation 1600. That was the time when Shakespeare lived. Mm. So yeah. a translation... Like up. Yeah, but a translation at that time would be in Old English. Exactly. Which would then take some thinking to translate it into modern English. And um, the, you, you were saying about uh, our Greek listeners being able to read the Greek page and then look across and see if it was correct in English. 
I'm not entirely sure because ancient Greek probably had different sentence structure to modern Greek. So you might actually need to understand ancient Greek rather than just Greek. Um, so, yeah, I mean, time changes everything, including language. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the way they talked in 200 AD would be different to the way they talk now in any language, not just English. So, And that's the reason why I, I, I was searching for the 1600 uh, translation because I was curious. I probably would never un not understand, although it is in English, but I was very curious. And, and, it, and again, if you guys know where I can find it, you can reach out and let me know. Um, I haven't been able to find it, but I'm just curious because I can put it side by side with the 1800s uh, version that I have and see out of curiosity the differences in, in the language. And, and like you said, Ray, um, it, time changes language drastically. So, I mean, I find it hard to understand the 1800s translation, and I can surely guarantee that I'm not going to understand the 1600 translation. But I'm still kind of curious about the sentence construction and the words. And it's going to be much like reading Shakespeare and trying to make sense of that. Exactly. On a good day, you might get something out of it. <laughs> Exactly. So I was. It was more out of curiosity. I mean, I did read some Shakespeare uh, for school. So um, I, I, it was a necessary uh, read for uh, the literature class because they want to get to again what we're talking about here, going back to the origins of English, so you can understand English better. And that's the reason why uh, it was uh, a required uh, read in my high school. Um, but that's pretty much what we're doing in this episode. Um, this should be a required read for sci-fi lover. Because... Sorry they put you through that, man. <laughs> Alas, poor Yorick. I knew him, Horatio. <laughs> <laughs> to be or not to be, that is the pencil. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So that was your, your first experience. So now going back to what I was going to say, uh, and, and just to kind of put in perspective, and, and I want to get an opinion on Ray on this. Um, basic, basically, the first thing that happened to Lucian, and um, and, and air quotes, <laughs> uh, is when he got into the ship and sailed away from Greece. With 50 men of like mind. Exactly. They uh, And a pilot who was very experienced and they paid a lot for. Yeah. They eventually encounter a river of wine. On an island after a storm. And I'm like, hmm, a river of wine. And in the book, they tell that they actually... Like a river. There you go. Like a river. <laughs> they actually fish from this river and they ate the fish. And they got, and drunk. got drunk. <laughs> Typical. And, and then they, they realized they probably should have mixed it with some freshwater fish <laughs> rather than wine fish. <laughs> so why? Because the fish were whining. <laughs> <laughs> they were a bit. They were a bit sweet and whiny. <laughs> when probably they, they were catching nagging cock, cuts. <laughs> when when they landed in this in this island, they encounter a plaque. I think it was a bronze plaque that said. Yeah. Basically, the Hercules and the Dionysus. Dionysus were there, mm -hmm. and I don't know if you know who he is, but he's the god of winemaking, orchards and fruits, vegetation, fertility, festivity, insanity, ritual, uh, ritual madness, religion, ecstasy, and theater. He's a busy boy. Yep. <laughs> so once. You know this. It kind of makes sense what they encounter, because uh, eventually they come into this place where they encounter vines with, you know, grape. I mean, I imagine they had, you know, grapes from the wine or whatever that might be. But they were shaped like women, and when they when this man approached them, this vine women. Invite them to kiss. Baby, give me those grapes. 
So <laughs> two of the men, two of the men, I don't know if they fav- they, they, they felt, uh, you know, brave or maybe hormones. I don't know what it is, but they accept it. Um, They've been drinking the Kool-Aid. Uh, yeah, they probably drank from the from the from the river <laughs> and ate too much fish, uh, <laughs> and uh, they kiss this vine women, and immediately they turn into vine. So, Lucian, seeing this, you know, all his men, they got scared and they got on their ships and left the doomed men behind. Um, that was that in the part of the book that you read, Ray? Was that? No, it wasn't. No, what? they 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 went upstream and found the vine women in, and they were releasing the the wine into the into the flow of the river, and um, they, it, it said that they they looked like women, but whenever anybody went close to them to try and grab the grapes off their vines, they complained loudly that, yes. that uh, their their grapes were not for eating, and told them to go away. And that's all that happened. So then they turned around and left. Yeah. And the version that I read, it was, and this is so interesting. And this is the reason why I'm bringing it up. Um, so you can see the differences in the translation. Um, and the one there, I think they were plucking the way, the, the grapes and they were screaming like in pain. And, but they did inv- invite them to, to kiss, to kiss them. And two of them, you know, felt you know, they haven't seen women in so Risky. long. Stick and, at the cabin, boy. And they suffer from it. They suffer from it. Well, which, well, you, version, which version did you get, uh, Gio? Uh, I get the one that they turn in stones, but I see the the likely similarity between both, the one that Ray got too. Because when you think about it, it has uh, metaphors. If you may call me crazy here, let's just go on the trip to the moon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but but if you think about it, uh, it it kind of brings some kind of philosophical uh metaphor about the secrecy of the virginity uh and how tempting it can be but that doesn't mean that you have to go for it you know or that there perhaps there is a way to get to it but not just resourcing to answer to your primal instincts and that's it yeah so it's like it's like a tale of of like if you do it the wrong way then you pay the price turn to stone or they scream and scare you off you know and something well well, while you were saying that uh, i i was just thinking about something here um and to answer delayed reaction here to a question that that ray placed earlier um about for example um, the book John Carter, uh, A Princess of Mars, right? Love it. Uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs. In his books, he is in his books, right? He is a character in his book. Superman. He, he got the uh, he got he got the the book from his uncle, and his uncle asked Edgar because uh, he knew he knew him since he was a little boy that he's allowed to publish uh, his stories 20 years after he dies. And apparently Edgar Rice Burroughs did exactly that, and that's where we get A Princess of Mars and all the following books. In this book, is Lucian, he's in the book, not necessarily the main character, but close enough. And all the stories that we hear in tell in these books are happening to him. The reason why I'm bringing this up is I have a feeling that Edgar Rice Burroughs at least read the story and was influenced by it. Uh, if not... Even Tolkien, bro. Even Tolkien. Yeah. Think about it. He's it, making the story, even though it's not about talking, he's making the story like Bilbo Bagging is making the story of himself in the past. Even talking that is a big writer. There's many writers that do this actually, and, and I think it's a very subtle way to rapture the the reader away into the story, to give him that first 
POV experience, right? Yeah, and I agree with that. But the reason why I was mentioning that other stuff was the fact that it, it, I like to think that that would be proof that Edgar Rice Burroughs read the book because he's yeah, doing exactly it. the same. He is in the story. Um, and, and I find it hard to believe that this um, being so early on as a sci-fi story would not influence many things coming right after. I agree. So, I agree. I wouldn't doubt that. Do you agree, Ray, or am I just, you know? No, I, I can see the similarity there. Whether or not he got that from that particular work or something else is, is hard to say, but I can yeah. see the similarity. Yes. And, and it's more likely than unlikely that all of these great writers of science fiction literature in the, in the previous uh, century were strangers to the work of Lucian, if you think about it. At least to me, it's... That's my, my, my perspective and my guesstimation. <laughs> yeah, I think we can even make Lucian a verb. The verb. <laughs> yeah. Lucian is going to Lucian. <laughs> it, it, the way it was written isn't like modern um, storytelling where you have people having conversations and things like that. Mm -hmm. it, it was very much, um, you know, a couple of guys sitting over tankards in the tavern telling each other stories like, oh, yeah, I went here and I did this and I did that and that happened and this happened. There was all these weird things. But there's no, like, recounting of conversation or anything like that. It was more a I'm telling you a story that happened to me. So it lacks that sort of in-the-moment feel. It's more the uh, I'm telling you what happened feel. Uh, which is which is different from most sci-fi writers these days. So it has that that bit of difference to it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but it, but as I said before, it kind of reminds me a bit of fan fiction in that you know suddenly goes off on a complete tangent. Uh, but um, it it also reminds me of now. Obviously, these movies weren't made before Lucien Lucien was first, but. Um, uh, the Adventures of Baron von Munchausen yeah. and Time Bandits. They both have that sort of a, of a feel of um, the recounting of a sort of a, an almost unbelievable trip. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Time Bandits was through time, but um, um, and Baron von Munchausen was popping around to all these various places. I think he went to the moon too. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, it, it has that Baron von Munchausen feel to it when you when you listen to it. But actually, Baron von Munchausen probably borrowed from Lucian rather than the other way around. Yeah. So we got to the part of the story that, you know, one of the one of the parts of the story is that that kind of impressed me and, and it kind of makes sense as to why. Um, you know, I, I like to think that, you know, it was close enough uh, to how really things are. But um, the truth might be that he said it that way because he wants to be the contrarian to what everybody else is writing at the time. And it's where... <laughs> I'm telling you, subscribe to YouTube. <laughs> You'll see why we get uh, derailed here. Uh, <laughs> um, so it's the fact when you know they left, the, the they got scared. The two men died, and they 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 spent, I think, seven days. Um, uh, not, not seven days. They 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 went to sea and they they encounter a world one when they lift them up into the clouds. Um, and that takes them uh, into space. And being in space, they got caught of a, a good wind, which seems very normal for someone that is traveling in the ocean. You know, when, when you caught a good wind, that means that you have uh, the, the direction of the wind is not only strong, but is, is also going um, to where you would like in the direction that you would like to go. Um, obviously, this is space. There's no wind in space. Do you, don't, wow. do you think? What about the solar wind? The book says otherwise. 
<laughs> what about the solar wind? Oh, solar wind. Maybe they had one of those uh, you know, sails. You light know? sail. Yeah. yeah. A light sail. Um, yeah. Which again, yeah, NASA, you're late with the voyage. You were late with the voyage. <laughs> yeah, lucky, Lu- lucky they could breathe too. Lu- Lucian did it first. <laughs> no spacesuits for these dudes. They were tough. <laughs> exactly. That's what astronauts should be, you know. Uh, <laughs> you can't hack a bit of open vacuum. You're just not tough enough for this, son. <laughs> Ancient Greek beat it, man. So you know. Yeah. Uh, Ancient so, Greek Schwarzenegger. There you go. <laughs> Get to the vessel. <laughs> Get to the vessel. <laughs> you know, but before we go in, we'll get well, before she gets trippier and starts flying. Uh, do you know something I was uh, thinking very much when when they were trying to get when they were trying to get out of the whale and in the ocean uh, talking about Calypso, the goddess and the fishman. And it reminded me a lot of Pirates of the Caribbean of of like ocean mythology and things like that. And I was like, this is older than that. Yeah. Where did it come from? You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, now that you mentioned the whale, that's another thing uh, interesting in this uh, in, in this book and how how much bullshit. <laughs> no, that was a whale from ReZero, bro. This whale. Right, Ray? Go, go home. That was a, but, but Ray, wouldn't you agree that's a whale from ReZero? Well, it wasn't flying. It, was it, it wasn't flying. It was, ah, it was, yeah, water. but it was swimming to the freaking moon. What's the difference? Well, let me, let me ask you this, right? In your versions, what was the ancient Greek uh, measurement of the length of the whale? Uh, it was 3 million. Uh, uh, it was uh, 3 million. No, no, it was three million. Oh, no, three million washing machines. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not an ancient Greek measurement. That's a current U.S. measurement, isn't it? No, that's that's actually a sci-fi remnant measure. That, How many that is, washing machines. That is a modern <laughs> measure, you know. <laughs> so, I just want to put it's in. Stadia. Yeah, yeah, it was stadia. Yeah. I don't know if you guys remember. I it, actually it, learned what the heck was a stadia because of this book because I had no idea what the heck it was. And every time I say so many stadias, I was like, what the heck is that? Yeah, and mine was furlongs. I honestly don't remember, but I did the calculations. Um, and, and I don't know if you guys don't remember, that's fine. So I can continue here. So what I came up with, it was around... 180 miles the distance uh, the, the the how this whale uh, the length of this whale was 100 around 100 187 uh, uh, miles uh, distance um, does someone here knows what is the 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 distance from sea level to the edge of space 30 miles it depends what you call space because um, they actually think recently that uh, atmosphere, in mm-hmm. inverted commas, may exist all the way out to the orbit of the moon. Oh, but yeah. obviously very, 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 very thin. Thanks, Virgin Airlines, for letting us know that you're going to fly us to the moon soon. Fly me to the moon. So, for as a point of reference, can someone give me a number? I I think, and I, I'm I'm guessing based on all the crap that I've seen, but I, I would say approximately near to a bit, a little more more than thirty <laughs> miles. <laughs> oh God! Yeah, follow, follow YouTube. Follow YouTube. That's, all, that's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> See proof. <laughs> it is an official weight of measurement. <laughs> it is. I, I will. I, I'm throwing a wild guess based on what I might remember, and I could be co- completely wrong. A bit more than 30 miles, I think it is, or 25, something like that. Well, when you do a quick uh, Google search, and, and just so you guys can follow through, uh, I typed how many miles to the edge of space, right? Very, very 
simple. And, and, and again, to answer my very, but it is says, is 100 ki kilometers or 62 miles? This is the answer that Dr. Google is. Hey, I got halfway there. I just half asked it. <laughs> well, I just typed in how far does the atmosphere extend, and it says 390,000 miles. Yeah. Okay, the world tiny, can swim around. Tiny wisps of the Earth's air stretch all the way into deep space, far beyond the moon's orbit, a new study suggests. Earth's geocorona, a tenuous cloud of hydrogen atoms, extends up to the 390,000 miles or 630,000 kilometers into space, according to the new research. Now, how many washing machines is that? <laughs> fast, fast, calculation. Quick, quick. <laughs> so for the, for the purpose of this example, I'm going to use the... The how many um, how many mile how many miles to the edge of space answer from Google. That is uh, sixty two miles to the edge. So that is basically the beginning, right? It's not where it ends, which could be three hundred uh, miles. So if the whale is standing on his head at sea level, that means that. He dies and gets crushed. You don't because of the weight of the body. <laughs> Aside from that, because of the gravity, uh, <laughs> we are talking about less. You, you don't even get to half. You don't understand the gravity of the situation. Yeah, I'm just kind of putting. In a, if you guys had a better uh, perspective, I just want to put a perspective to to the listeners on how long the whale was. It's 187 miles. And 62 miles is the distance from, from sea level to the edge of space. Just want to put it in perspective. Do you, have, you guys have a better um, perspective? I mean, you probably probably have a better perspective than I do. But I want to see a whale do a nose stand. <laughs> I'd be impressed to see that. Especially on the surface of the ocean. Could be, <laughs> so, could be tricky. He was a big whale. That's what she said. <laughs> <laughs> it was a big whale. Uh, Lucian says that he encounters whole civilizations. And they were at war. So what did they do? They killed the whale by giving it diarrhea by starting a fire inside of it. <laughs> <laughs> they lit fire to a forest and they escaped. But I mean, we're escaping. But it took him almost a week. Yes. With that uh, fire going on. I don't know how they didn't choke on the fire inside of it. Maybe because but, of the hole on the top of the whale? Maybe. But I'm not going to ask you, Robert, because your <laughs> devil advocate itself is you. It's the hole on the top of the... <laughs> oh, yeah, the chimney. <laughs> we'll have Smoke inhalation. <laughs> so, you know, this... And this is the point where we're bringing this up. You know, it, it has a lot of holes, right? And, and, and when you read it, including at the top, yeah, including at the top of the way, <laughs> a lot of holes. Well, they used to go out to the gills and and wash themselves. Yes. <laughs> so, but but then again, you know that, that's the reason why I was bringing it up is, is they because... just made sure they just made sure that they changed the air filter hole in, in, in the, 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 the air filter in the hole of the well. There was a air filter. Yeah, like the AC bro, <laughs> you know. Uh, so you know this is obviously to, you know towards the ancient problems and ancient solutions. solutions there you go <laughs> so going back to to the the beginning the the trip to the moon once they they got there uh, there's a couple of things that i want to uh, explain as a comparison so they eventually you know through catching a good wind, they ended up on the, on the moon and found, you guessed it, civilization. Um, however, they got caught by uh, beings on vultures. They were acting as police and they got arrested, I guess, for trans trespassing. And they got taken to the king uh, of the moon, which uh, Damien which happens to be a Greek man and was not only human, but spoke 
Greek. And he asked them if, you know, they, they, they had this war going on. Uh, he was, which is something interesting because he said, yeah, I'm going to take care of you, right? And then he asked him to war. How is that taking care of them? Is, is, was that in the version that, that, that you guys read? It might was. Okay. It, it was more a case of, um, so what have, you been, what have you been up to, Endymion? Oh, we're going to war against the people of the sun. You want to join us? Got <laughs> better to do. Yeah, sure, okay. Nonchalantly. <laughs> Nonchalantly. Yeah, why not? You know, nothing better to do. We can join your war. So, it's on our way there. <laughs> so they got uh weapons and they got vultures and these are huge vultures by the way um they're sure there were no condors no they're definitely vultures <laughs> so they went uh in a war against the uh the sun people so we, we kind of talked about earlier how uh the king the, the of the sun had backup right so they they have the the slingers from the milky way and and the the cent the cloud centaurs from i can't remember where they were from so the slingers from um from the milky way did not show up so the sun got mad at them and destroyed their home planet uh but yeah in this war we had, and let me see if I can do a recount here. So they team up with a hundred moon soldiers and one million other galactic allies. Dude, that is an epic space battle if I seen one. Right? Come on, bro. This dude went to freaking Ragnarok. So <laughs> Midgar for the fight of Ragnarok. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> It, they got, you know, the the forces use birds, like Ray mentioned earlier, uh, uh, made out of vegetable. Lettuce. They have they, lettuce leaves. Exactly. They have flea, flea mounts. They had spiders uh, that, that may, it created this huge um, spider web that they used as a field of battle, which convenient much, right? Of course, what are you going to walk on? <laughs> <laughs> and, and one of the things, and I think it, it surprised me as much as it did the person who did the video that we, is actually on the link, so go ahead and click on it and yeah. watch that video. It was fun, man. Um, they, he, he, decided, he decides to name one of the spiders and he called them Oeth, son of fair weather. Now, I agree with um, uh, let me see what uh, Austin, uh, he's the creator of that video, when he said that um, why that spider? I mean, and, and you know, he has a point, right? It, it, we are very very far away from the original um, intended audience for this book. Yeah. And, and they, like Ray said earlier too, there's a lot of Easter eggs in reference to not only other authors of the time, but maybe personalities, um, maybe events and things that happened back then that we will never know. So, it, 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 I find it really interesting that we might never know what this was a reference to. It's just very odd that, you know, out of all the spiders that, that were in this war, which there were many, you have a name for one of them. You know, it, it's, it sounds like this is an Easter egg, so something that happened back then. It's just favoritism. It was a regular thing out there. <laughs> we have 200 feet long ant mounds, mosquito mounds. Uh, we had their soldiers that were throwing <laughs> poison radishes. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
the red the reddish flingers. It's like something reddish out of Monty flingers. Python. I want to see that. In Listen, movie. are the reddish flingers? <laughs> I want to see that. <laughs> you know, can someone please make a movie, a war movie, where you have a platoon just throwing poison radishes at the enemy? Please, I want to see that. Uh, we had like. I like I like to envision centurions, right, from the Roman Empire, with spear made out of asparagus and mushroom shields. Yep. And my favorite, dogs riding winged acorns. <laughs> I want a plushie. Oh, I, want a, a winged acorn. I want a plushie. I'm telling you. <laughs> So out of all the ones that I mentioned, and I'm I always going to do this checks because there's so many. And, and again, if you out there are listening to us <clears throat> recounting this, if the version that you read is different, please reach out or put it in the comments. We want to know if your version had something that ours didn't have or if your version didn't have what, you're, what we're mentioning. And this is the reason why I want to make a check. But um, so far, and, and Gio's your version or Ray, your version, um, did they had all the ones that I mentioned? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Just want to make sure. So this is the one that Ray alluded to earlier that, you know, they won the war, but the Cloud City Centaurs got, finally got to the battle when they were, uh, when the battle was over and, and kind of reclaimed, um, got everybody... Uh, collected as prisoners of war, and they took him back to this, the, the city of the sun and in front of the king of the sun. And um, the sun decided he's going to put a cloud of, uh, uh, a curtain cloud in between the sun and the moon as punishment. Uh, and Edamian <clears throat> didn't want his people to suffer. So he kind of... Um, Conceded, if I might want to say that, I can't find a better word for it. So uh, they they kind of sat down and did an agreement to the war. So uh, in exchange for taking down the, cur the curtain of uh, cloud curtain, and the people of the moon will now be uh, suffering in the darkness. Um, they um, they I think it was going to be like a gallons of how many gallons of dew oh yeah the, the 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 king of the moon had to pay the king of the sun every year 200 barrels of dew dew yes a hundred oh With, yes a hundred thousand gallons of dew oh. and and in return they would share the morning star as um, like they both put colonies on there yeah so, so far, and you guys correct me if your your version was slightly different, because as far as I know, we all read a complete different version. So, and it, it's another thing that I find really interesting, and there's, there's so many versions of this book. Um, so, they, the, the people on the moon... That's another another topic of conversation um, that we now might, might not get too into it, but um, there's no men on the moon. So apparently... No, what, there's no women. The, I'm sorry, there's no women on the moon. So in the version that I read, right, they, when they marry... For the first 25 years of marriage, they are husbands and they can get pregnant carrying their, their, their children on the calf of the leg. And then after, um, no, hold on a second, I, I said it backwards, 25 years, they get married. Then after the 25 years, they turn into husbands. That's what I meant to say. So the first 25, their their wife. They can get married, they have children in the Catholic lack, and then they turn into husbands. 
Was that in the version of, of the book that you read? Or was that avoided altogether? I think in the one that I had, it was avoided altogether because I think mine was sanitized. The one that I the one the one that I that I went through was up to ten years, but yeah, he said he said that they were they could become pregnant and have offsprings up to ten years, and then they would come in. Okay, so yeah, there's slightly differences on the on the versions. Um, they have flying frogs that they pluck up. You know, they just grabbed out of midair and fried them, and that's for food. Um, and, and I'm gonna continue with this, and you guys stop me, please, if this is not in your version. Um, they, um, they had, and, and I'm going to paint a picture of the moon people, right? Based on this book. They have one toe in each foot. Um, they, is when they sneeze, honey comes out. When they exercise, yep. they exercise, and they wipe their forehead as milk. Checks out. The belly is just a pocket they use casually, you know, to put your keys on, and you know. And it's and it's furry on the inside. <laughs> and so when the children when the children get cold, they just climb in there. <laughs> there you go. That's where Australian kangaroo comes from. <laughs> 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 oh god so their clothes are made of glass that's one thing that i could not visualize when i was reading this occupational glass, hazard glass clothes imagine they don't break right let's imagine that that's let's take that away from the equation how do you walk <laughs> how, do, how do you tie your tie <laughs> exactly how do you um, tie your shoes uh, another good point uh <laughs> Well, you've only got one toes. When, when they want to look at something, let's say, for example, they're sitting down at a cafe, right? And they're enjoying their coffee. And they want to see it, something over there, but they don't want to stand up or move. They could take one eye out, put it in their direction, see what's going on, and then put it back on their eye socket. Gara for Naruto, bro. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and apparently, apparently rich people had collections of eyes so they could swap them in and out depending on how they were feeling. Didn't you find that freaky? And then the, I think Lucian found it freaky and he asked about it. It's like, no, it's not a big ordeal. I have a cabinet full of eyes. You want one? <laughs> so they kind of like, it, it, if you're missing one, you can just grab one from the street, put it on and you can see. Sure, here. Yeah. And uh, the final um, thing in here is I, I really hope that Lucian wasn't hungry because their ears were made out of leaves. Yep. So that, that paints a picture of the moon men. Doesn't that sound like a horror movie? It sounds bizarre, but... <laughs> If you look at it from an objective point of view and you think about it, it kind of brings the the idea of becoming more accepting of new or different things. Because the way that he puts it, he's freaked out as Lucian, the Greek guy, but then this person is like, no, that's normal. You know? It's just different. Yeah. And, and he kind of he kind of tries to to subconsciously tell the writer that difference, cultural differences, something that might be normal somewhere else could be completely bizarre or strange where you are from. Yeah. Cultural differences, temporal differences. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, another point that I want to make in this book is when he's describing his time on the moon after, you know, they, they were liberated... From the war, they were taken to the moon. They, 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 they came back as heroes, which I quite don't understand. Maybe because because they didn't they didn't win the war. They lost the war. 
uh, but maybe they came back to here uh, as heroes because of the agreement that between that they did between the two countries because they they did say within that agreement that they they had a pact that if any other countries get ever attacked they will defend each other um so right there they got security uh, but after they went back and he's describing his time something that i find really hilarious on this book is his account of the description of a device they had on the moon it's a shallow well with a glass top where he says you look down it and you could see any you know he could see his family he could hear his family he can hear anyone or see anyone back on earth that he wanted and the, what i find funny about it is his comment where he says, and, and I think I might be paraphrasing, paraphrasing this, but he says, if you think I'm lying about the well and the the moon. all the people from on earth from the moon, if you think I'm lying about that, go to the moon. Yeah, and, and, see yourself, and when you see, you'll know that I'll tell that I am telling the truth. And mm -hmm. and <laughs> I don't know. I just want to mention that because I, I I chuckled when I read it for the first time, when I understood it for the first time. Let me correct myself there. Because, you know, it, not only is it a contradiction from the beginning of the book, but it's like, who is going to go and check that out? Who's going to go to the moon? I mean, obviously, we have gone to the moon now. Um, Did you? And we found, well, not me personally, but, you know, <laughs> we, we could see videos of uh, astronauts going to the moon. And, Don't uh, steal Armstrong's thunder, Robert. Well, we didn't see a, we didn't see the kingdom of the moon. And obviously we didn't see that, that shallow well. Mm -hmm. So maybe it got destroyed. You know, it has been almost 2000 years. So, you know, maybe that was there and it got destroyed, but I find it really hilarious that he's telling people and he's challenging people back then that if you think I'm lying, go and check it out. Yeah. It's like, wait, didn't he say it was a lie in the beginning? <laughs> <laughs> I'm confused. <laughs> but it was tricky because after I, re I read the book, I went to pee and I had to look at my sky or map mm -hmm. to see where the moon was to make sure that I was giving it back when I was pissing. So I had to go into my bathtub and piss. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, my question to you guys is like when you read that that piece did you get the same experience as i did i mean what was your thought when you went to that portion of the story it was bewildering to me the idea of that long distance communication the the, the concept of it he had it you know mm -hmm. where did that came from you know that's that's one big idea that it kind of exists in one way or another today, you know? Yeah. And when you think about 200 AD, and this guy was talking about that, it's like, wow. It, it is wow. Like, it is lightly freaky. I mean, how many times can you just pick up your phone and dial someone like across the world and see their face? Yep. Um, granted, this we know is not the same thing, but it's still freaky to know that this was written 200 year AD. Mm -hmm. And it's something so eerily close to what we have now. Not necessarily a well, but the concept. Behind. Hey, you can grab a well and just dump your phone on it while you're FaceTiming. <laughs> Works for me. Ray, what, what do you what what was your thought on that? Um on that it, it it seemed to be something that was repeated again in that final story when he went up to see Jupiter, because Jupiter had chairs that they could sit in and hear what was going on on the earth as well, and all the prayers that were being sent up. So mm -hmm. it seems like a fairly common, well, you know, if these places are far away, there must be some method where they can hear what we're saying. Yeah. I, I think that it, it all derives from the from the old origin of the old seeing eye of a god, too. I think that that's the main origin that that idea comes from, if you think of it, too. Because a god can see and hear his omnipresence, on, omnipotent, so he can be everywhere all at once hearing anything from Whatever, whatever he's in the universe, right? Yeah, and I think that's that's the core of that idea comes from that very 
primitive uh, story of what a god is. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I guess we're ready for, for the last question on this episode. Um, and, and it's slightly unfair because um, you guys haven't read it as, as many times. Um, and, and I like to think that the more you read, the more you'll be exposed to different versions of this. So the collected um, experience could or might give you a whole picture of what the story was. Uh, but my question is, and, and I guess I can go, I can go first and let you guys follow after. What is your last impression, or, or should I let you go first since I read it multiple times already? How would you like? Yeah, you should go last, I think. I'm sorry. You should go last. You probably got more to say. Okay. Well, I'll go first. Go ahead. Uh, I think that is a worth to read more than once. It's a hilarious read, read uh, book, and it's quite amusing. Honestly, that's the best word I can use for for the refreshing feeling that it gave me when I read it. It's quite amusing and it's entertaining to see all of these ideas and then putting your mind together the time that it was made and create the awareness of that as you read it. Uh, it's impressive. So I would definitely suggest it to any person that doesn't know about this to go back in time and have a trip to the moon. Awesome. Okay, right. Raimundus, Scientificus. Med Scientificus. I can't even say it, man. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. Um, this is an eye opener. Uh, if you think about it in context of when it was written, the fact that probably nothing else before it was anything like it. How a guy said, "Hold my, hold my amphora of wine." I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to bullshit like you, like you've never been bullshitted before, and then he did, <laughs> and it turned into a whole new genre. It's pretty damn amazing. Um, yeah, uh, it's it's worth checking out just for its historical value. I mean. Um, you mightn't be quite the sci-fi aficionados that we are and want to read it over and over again, or you might, you never know. But I think it's worthwhile for anybody who, you know, doesn't want to have to turn in their sci-fi card to check it out at least once. And you can find it on multiple versions of it on YouTube, um, even the PG-13 version that I, that I listen to. So it cuts out all the, the um, horrible people being turned into trees by other trees and stuff like that. But... Um, yeah, it, um, uh, it really is amazing to think that somebody could have come up with this with, you know, no, like we're all soaked in sci-fi. So, you know, we've all got all those tropes floating around in our heads. This guy had none of that. He just came up with it all off the cuff. Probably some mushrooms were involved as, um, sure as Captain Chaos said, but it's, they were good mushrooms. That was yeah. a good crop that Hell year. Hell yeah. They're great <laughs> mushrooms. I'm having whatever he was having. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I wasn't <laughs> about that uh, But yeah, no, it was just, uh, it, it's amazing for what it is. And it is historical and it's worth reading. So have it, check it out and then think about what came after it in relationship to this. And you get that that sort of feeling of wow, you know, things have really come a long way. You might, you might be getting bored with current sci-fi, saying, "Oh, everybody's repeating themselves and this and that and the other." But when you when you realize, you know, what what was you for yourself, and, yeah, where it came from, you can sort of see how much things have changed and developed and improved, and and maybe appreciate current sci-fi more for having seen this. Yeah. So. My last impression it comes from my multiple reads. Um, and, and again, you know, I had the discussion with uh, Gio when we were um, with our Captain Chaos when we were at, having the watch party on Discord. Um, I had a lot to say. And I had to kind of shorten my notes. Um, because I, I, like I told him, I don't want to make the uh, I Am Rubber episode again. So... <laughs> Hello, I am Robert. Welcome to Hello, I am Robert. I, I I really wanted to hear 
your thoughts on this book um, because I enjoyed it that much. Um, so I had to kind of shorten my notes. Um, I, I read, like I said, um, I recommend reading the actual book, not necessarily. Uh, you could actually go into uh, and find the, the Audible version if you like. Um, Stop hating you, on me, Robert. If you're not one of those uh, readers. Well, you do, you did re read the, um, the Audible version. Yeah, that's what I'm so, saying. Stop hating on me. <laughs> so you could read the Audible version. Uh, but the, the, the point that I'm trying to make is um, so far in my experience, uh, the versions that have the most information um, about the story are in written form. <clears throat> and, and it might be something to do with the medium that this was being told. Um, although Audible books are known to be longer today than they were when they, the Audible thing started. Um, but if you can't find uh, one that has um, all of the story, which has been my experience, I recommend that you read the multiple versions. So as a collective uh, story, you get the whole picture. And the reason why I'm saying this is because the book is short, right? Uh, and you are going to find versions that have five or six of his books in it. Um, like, for example, the Audible version that you read, Gio, remember I told you, oh, it's chapter three. No, no, it's chapter four. So those other chapters were other books, right? Yeah, and I actually took on the preface unknowingly for a full hour of blabbering <laughs> and not the story. <laughs> so, yes, um, the the story has many names. It's a true uh I seen it called true story, true history, a true story, a true history, uh, trips to the moon, uh, and many others in between. But why am I saying this? It's because it's worth it. It's it's short. It's a short read. I think the audible version, accounting for the other books, is like three hours. Gio, would you agree with me when I say that the actual book? from the Audible is actually an hour? It's more than an hour. It's, it's like two hours and a half. Because there's another book at the end. Uh, and the whole book is three hours. So I, that's why I'm assuming it would be like an the hour. One I, the one I got was the actual book. It had like 45 minutes of the pref preface, and then it was like two hours and a half of the actual book, and, and it ends at the end of the actual story. Okay, okay. So, yeah, it is a short book. Um, I want to do say that the version that I read, the, the multiple versions that I have found so far, they, they're very hard to understand because of the language. And I had to read it multiple times for that reason. Um, so if you're one of those that don't want to go through, through that, and then you can go ahead and read the Audible or the versions, the multiple versions that you can find on YouTube where someone actually read them uh, for you and get the, the experience. Uh, if you go that route, I might recommend you go for multiple versions so you can get the full story. Um, Ray, how long was the version that you read on YouTube? Do you remember? Um, I think we were looking at somewhere around 2.15 to 2.30. Okay. So it's, it's, it's uh, longer than two hours. Um, yeah, but what, what I got was the... Um, the story went up to the bit where he said, and the what happened on the on the other side of the world will be recounted in future volumes. And then it switched over to a completely different story about flying to the moon, which I thought, you know, trips to the moon. This is another trip to the moon where, where he stuck bird wings on his back and flew up to the moon and the moon bitched about all the people on Earth crapping <laughs> on her. And, and then he went off to talk to the gods and Jupiter and took the message from the moon to Jupiter and then I, I thought it was actually still part of it. Like it was just a, it, it, but that may have been a completely separate story tacked on the end. I don't know. Yeah. He did write over 80 stories. So we're talking about a busy writer, um, but it is a fun read. Once you understand um, it is, um, it's really amazing. Uh, and, and I'm trying not to echo what has been said already by uh, Captain Chaos and our math scientists here, uh, but it's amazing to consider 
that what you're reading was written close to 2,000 years ago. And that is totally amazing. The fact that, as um, Ray mentioned, this person has no precursor to what a sci-fi story is. And as far as I know, he had no idea that he invented a genre. It's just totally amazing that a person, and, and, and attest to the, to the power of the human brain, that a person can come up with a story like that off the cuff, completely um, uh, without any precursor or, or, or something ever, you know, being done like that. And the story speaks, uh, you know, to the testament of the human uh, ingenuity because you could find the story today. And, and, and that is another thing that amazes me is the fact that you can actually Google this and find it. Um, it's something that has been written so long ago. And, and you know, time usually, uh, you know, with time things get lost. And this is something that thankfully did not get lost with time. And I, I really do appreciate it for being what it is and, and, and understand sci-fi just a little bit better by going back to the roots. So if you have the chance to read it, I recommend you actually read the book. Uh, if you don't, it's okay. You can find it on Audible uh, or on YouTube uh, and, and read it and then come back to us and let us know what you think. Um, I strongly believe that if you are um, a sci-fi lover as much as we are, you are going to really enjoy this story. Yeah. So, okay. It's lucky that it wasn't written like 250 years earlier. Because mm. it might have been in the Library of Alexandria when it burnt, and then we'd never get to hear it. Exactly. <laughs> And yeah, and, and we don't know. That's that's another another point that we talked about it here is that we don't know if there was something earlier than this that could have been considered sci-fi. Yeah. Because that those got they got lost to time, lost to the fire. So yeah. So yeah, let us know. Reach out. And I'm really curious to see if this was able to broaden your horizons uh, within the sci-fi um, genre. So, are we ready for our last segment? Yes, sir. I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> there's, there's hardcore science here. There's hardcore science here. Everybody's really? going to love my science in the science fiction for this one, bro. So. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you can take this one. <laughs> I'm happy to <laughs> can't ball it to you. Okay, so I, I yeah, the, we're, we're going to be slim on this one for <laughs> obvious reasons, for very, very obvious reasons. Uh, one of those being that Lucian was pissed and he did this out of spite. And, and I, think that, I think that this book uh, revolves more around philosophical and uh, met metaphorically philosophical matters than actual science. Science fiction was the happy accident result of it, you know. And that is is, and you have a really good point there when you say that because that is the reason why I said this section is slim, because not only was there no science fiction stories prior to this, but technically no science either. I mean, well, sci science yeah. is the study of of life basically of, of yeah. our existence and people have always been wondering about it but the problem was back then they didn't have a lot of equipment to do the measuring with yes. and they could they could say well i saw this happen i saw that happen and i think this might have been the reason but there's no they they didn't really have a way to test it they didn't have the equipment to test it with so a lot of it was just well i think it's like this and not in the main story, but the following one that I was talking about with the guy flying up to um, to the moon and the moon giving him a message to take on to Jupiter. Um, he was ragging the hell out of the, the debaters 
uh, the the orators, because he said that each and every one of them had a different opinion and none of them agreed with each other. And they all wanted to be paid to pass on this knowledge, right? <laughs> this, well, I think it's like this. Um, and none of them had any facts. None of them had any evidence. Uh, there was no peer-reviewed papers. Uh, science, as we understand it today, did not exist at that time. There was people who had ideas, but none of them could be well tested. Mm -hmm. That they, they they were pretty reasonably advanced in mathematics because that's pretty straightforward. I mean, you can just have, use proofs and things like that, and say, you know, like like um, uh, ge geometry was a thing. Um, uh, and, yeah, but there was still no measuring in washing machines. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, until, until you measure in washing machines, you can't really consider yourself. Yeah, that's true. That, 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 that's a measure of true science right there. Yeah, so. that's what's going to get us to understand quantum science, bro. Washing <laughs> machines. <laughs> so, so I expect within the next 20 years a, a book, an expose to be written by our own Captain Chaos because yes. called Truth, Lies, and Washing Machines. <laughs> <laughs> what lies in the depths of the washing machine? Best selling, <laughs> best selling on Amazon top books. <laughs> quantum quantum mechanics for the chaos. Careful, you don't know the power of words. <laughs> you would be surprised. And that's how we do it. Right? <laughs> Sorry, <Yeah>. Ray. <laughs> <laughs> what 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 did did I have a mental um like uh track there that i got run off of i'm not entirely uh, sure yeah we got we, we got the, we got the mm. real so <laughs> yeah yeah we did so um you know there was a bit of astronomy going on um but basically science exists today because it is shared across the entire planet thanks to the internet science well one of one of the main reasons for the for for well what sorry i gotta take a step back arnet is the original internet, which the, the 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 public internet sort of came off of, was created for scientists to share their knowledge quickly and easily. Before that, you had to wait for books to come in from the other side of the planet, and that could take six months. So the sharing of scientific knowledge was really slow up until um, and the the Rnet was created. And that was originally to share scientific information between researchers. And then off the side of that came, you know, the military um, uh, information net and the public information net. And once the public information net became, you know, the thing that everybody connected into, I mean, I had this discussion with my son, who's 10, um, just the other day, and I said, okay, Try to imagine this. When I was 10, there was no internet, there was no smartphones, there was no streaming services, there was no YouTube, there was no iPads, there was And I'm just listing all these things that didn't exist when I was his age. And he's like, what? What the hell did but, you do? Well, yeah, what, what the hell did you do? I, I, actually, said, <laughs> I actually am in the same bucket, man. Well, there was Nintendo back there, but that's mm -hmm. it. And people told me, like, what the heck do you do? And I like, play outside, ride bike, yeah. throw the yeah. ball. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Make like, it up in what? your head because there was no screen to stare at for floor you know, is lava. Two hours <laughs> floor is lava. <laughs> floor is lava. Yeah. I got in so much trouble for climbing on the furniture. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, basically, and that's just in in less than one lifetime, because yeah, I'm only 50. <laughs> Young, yeah, sure. But <laughs> in 40 years, it changed that much. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about something 1,800 years ago and change. Yeah. And that's the difference for 40 years. What's the difference for 400 years? What's the difference for 1,800 years? Everything back then was completely different. They had no way to share this information. They had no way to... to um, ratify it and make sure that it was correct. There's no peer review. There was no uh, sharing of information like that. So, uh, and, you know, like somebody may have invented a battery and then, you know, there was a big big storm or a flood or something and their entire civilization was wiped out and it was gone. And it wouldn't be reinvented again for 15, 1,600 years. Mm -hmm. And that's what used to happen yeah. before 
globalization and the sharing of information. Now you can have a tsunami wiping out millions of people and that information isn't lost. The information that, that, that was generated there is not lost because it's been shared. So that's part of the wonders of humanity in that we are forward thinking enough not to leave all our eggs in one basket on one coast <laughs> anymore. Um, but yeah, I mean, science in those days was very, very patchy. And in that, that last story on, on the video that I listened to, he was basically ragging on all these people because they all had differing opinions and none of them had any anything to back it up. And they were all asking to be paid so that they could pass on their truths of the universe. <laughs> and it was all like, well, I think it's true, so it must be. <laughs> it all, but this is an opinion because <laughs> I have nothing to back it up. <laughs> From telepathy to cell phones. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean... Um, yeah, the science was not really scientific, <laughs> unfortunately. I mean, I mean, different people in different places could look at something and and sort of get the same or reach the same conclusions about how it happened. But unless you can go and prove it, like you can look up at the moon and say, "Is it inhabited? Is there a man in the moon? Is it made of cheese?" But you couldn't prove any of that. Not until 1969. <laughs> couldn't prove any of it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they had no way of doing that, and they wouldn't for hundreds of years. We don't know if the moon still is made out of cheese because by the time that they grab it off, it goes to the outer space and it just breaks up. Well, you, didn't you say it was made of cocaine? <laughs> oh, yeah, dust. <laughs> Are you doing illusion and contradicting yourself? Is that what it is? Pretty yeah. Much. I'm going to use that as a verb going I am forward. chaos. I am chaos. <laughs> he is chaos. He is chaos. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, without, without proof, it's all conjecture and opinion. So that makes it very difficult. And it wasn't like they were trying. It's just that they had no way to be sure. So hu human beings are very prone to filling in the gaps with legend and and gods and all sorts of things because they don't know how it happened and they don't like not knowing so that somebody makes up something because they're arrogant enough to think that their imagination must be the truth and if they tell enough people enough people accept it then it becomes accepted and then it's carried through the centuries and that's why we have mythology and and all those other things because they didn't have a way to work out what the hell was actually going on. But human beings don't like not knowing. And that's why we're explorers and we're scientists and we're inventors and all those other awesome things that humans do is because we want to know and we want to do it better. And I like that about humanity. Yeah. So that's what it was. Why things bother me if, if, I'm, okay, if I'm not okay if I don't find the answer. Mm -hmm. That's it. <laughs> uh, and, I mean, that's why we have science fiction, because people are imagining what the future is going to be like. And then people who, you know, are engineers and scientists and stuff who may not have as good an imagination, watch these things and go, hey, that sounds like a cool idea. I wonder if I can make it. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to quote Robert here, but that's like he said in many episodes. But science is always imitating art to make it real. Right? And then art imitates science and it mm -hmm. leapfrogs itself yeah. over and over again. And that's another great part of humanity. Even if you don't have the imagination to come up with a, an idea for an invention which is going to improve society, somebody else may have had that idea and then you can watch the science fiction and go, hey, that's a cool idea. I've watched 2001 A Space Odyssey and they were carrying around little screens which you know had computers in them. There's no way they could build it back then, but hey, maybe with our microchips now we can. And then, you know, in 2000 and whatever it was, 2001 or something, the iPad's invented. You yeah. see, and you see, it raised so much more sophisticated than me because my idea translated to chaos is like, hey, you have monkeys and 12 monkeys that can bite people and make them crazy. I want to do that. I want to go to the zoo and make it all fucking loose and crazy. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> some people are working on improving humanity and then there's Gian. Exactly. <laughs> but, but hey, the, the funny thing about what you say is that it's indirectly a collective effort because somebody, oh, yeah. somebody sure. might have the idea but don't know how to do it and somebody might have the expertise and knowledge of the technologies that can get the result of that product or tool, you know? And it's all sped up since the internet came into being because the, the, the conversation that I was having with my son actually started with um, encyclopedias. He's like, what's an encyclopedia, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> I had those, bro. And I, I said, well, those. imagine if the internet was in a massive collection of books. That's an encyclopedia. <laughs> yep. Except it doesn't get updated regularly. You have to keep ask him, going. Ask him if it was an index. Ask yeah. him if it was an index. <laughs> <laughs> and when so you, you want to search, lost. and when you want to search something, you go. <laughs> yep. There's no Google. It's called Index. Yeah. It's called the <laughs> Dewey Decimal System. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I had to explain to him all about what what a um, Encyclopedia Britannica was and a World Book and all these things and oh my. how we used to go and look those up. And if we couldn't find it, then we had to go to the library. And oh, good luck. And of course, the book you always wanted was out. And, do, do, do we feel old? Do we? Yeah. And I'm including Gio here. Of course, bro. The kids these days don't know even what they think. They don't even know what a fax dial tone is. They don't even know that that's not a fax dial tone. That's internet dialogue too. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know what a CD burner is, bro. Or a floppy disk. Yeah. Oh, I heard a joke about that the other day. Uh, somebody found a floppy disk in an old box in the in the closet, and their son walks up and goes, "Oh, you 3D printed the save icon. That's really cool." <laughs> <laughs> oh God, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> and that's a perfect example of out of context looking at things backwards. Just look which, at it. which look I've at talked about multiple times. In, in this podcast about how you've got to think about what Lucian was doing and how none of the sci-fi that we swim in and take for granted existed. Like he yeah. had none of that. And that's why what he did was so amazing. Awesome. Hey, Gio, you had something uh, else to bring. I, I don't know if you want to bring that up. I mean, I have other stuff here that I'm not really going to go. Oh, I have some... So little fun science even though well let's see how it goes it's, uh, it's about Rene Descartes uh, he's the renowned philosopher and mathematician that made significant contributions to the science behind navigation by introducing the concept of Cartesian coordinates which is not being used or applied on the book <laughs> Cartesian <laughs> coordinates a mathematical is a, a mathematical system that uses two or more numbers to specify the position of a point in space rel relative to a coordinate origin. This system uh, greatly facilitates navigation and map making, also useful to navigate through colossal whales and flying sailboats that can give you a ride to the moon where you can ride giant insects. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now, 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 now. Sound like a theme park. What's on point? What's on point with it with the book though? <laughs> oh god. <laughs> That's thank you. That's I like that. <laughs> awesome. So if you out there have actually read this book uh, or or listened to the book, um and um you probably will understand why we're very thin on the science department for this episode. <laughs> I love that. Uh, awesome. So I guess we have come to the end of this episode. Um, I, I can't say this enough, um, how I would recommend this uh, book. If you, especially if you're a sci-fi lover, if you love sci-fi and you want to see where your favorite IP came from, um, this is a fun read. Um, I really will invite you guys to, if you have not subscribed yet, to go to our YouTube channel. 
Um, and if you're listening a month later, and if you're if you're watching a month later on YouTube right now, just go ahead and click on that subscribe button and uh, ring the bell. And Gio, can you tell them what would happen when we get how many subscribers? Ten thousand. When we get ten thousand, we have the hashtag ten k as tattoo. <laughs> so. What we're going to do is we can do either or we're going to make a poll so our audience can choose something sci-fi related that I'm going to tattoo on my butt cheek or I'm going to tattoo a Spartan Master Chief, not a Spartan from Lucian, no, <laughs> <laughs> that's going to be doing a hard sign saying Spartan in the streets, lover in the sheets. <laughs> He's very keen on that one. Hell yeah. Yeah. So, yes, remember, uh, we are in every pod that you find. Um, you can also join our Discord. We're Discord. like everything bagel, but for podcasts. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> there is, if you're listening to the pod, there is a link on the description of this episode that will take us to, uh, they will take you to our uh, Discord server. Uh, if you are actually... Uh, watching our YouTube, you could see here Captain Chaos is leaning on the Discord invite. All you have to do is scan that right from your screen uh, if you are not using your phone, obviously. Who needs battle minds, right? <laughs> it will take you to our Discord. And uh, come over and let's discuss this episode or any other episodes that you uh, uh, enjoy or... Uh, if you uh, notice that we have not covered your favorite IP uh, and we can add it to future episodes. And don't forget, we have our website. Um, it is sciencefictionremnant.com. Or if you are watching this video on YouTube, you can scan the QR code and it'll take you there. Uh, we have really cool um, um, stories that we have uh, written on there um, kind of go along with the theme of this podcast. And that I think you'll, if you enjoy this podcast, you'll probably enjoy the read. Very short, three-minute uh, reads. Uh, if you want to help the pod, we do have a Patreon. Uh, you can go to our Patreon. The links will be there. And if you are uh, obviously watching this on YouTube, you can just scan that QR code and it will take you there. So we really appreciate the help. Uh, and if you are not that committed, you could still help. Um, you can go to buy us a coffee. You know, uh, our very own Captain Chaos needs to be very caffeinated. So um, that would help greatly. So thank you for any help that you could do. And of course, uh, if you can't, for some reason, do any of the things that we have mentioned before, you can always just share this podcast, share the show with everyone and help us uh, grow the science fiction community. So again, for all of you out there who has who are followed uh, have followed our show um, from season one, from season two, doesn't matter where if you are you're you're coming to us every week. Uh, we want to say thank you. We really appreciate your support, uh, your engagement, and your conversation. So thank you so much for making us your favorite pod. And we look forward to have you with us next week. Till so next that, time. thank you so much. And we'll see you next time. Hold my amphora of wine. Have I got a story to tell you? <laughs> 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 <laughs>